Well, I, I want to uh, explain a little bit about why I should even be sitting here talking to you and, and uh, why I'm qualified to do that, if I'm qualified to do that. Uh, a few years ago, my wife and partner and I uh, organized land that we owned in Hawaii as a nonprofit that could be turned into a botanical garden. And this is a unique botanical garden in that our focus is on psychoactive plants and plants with a history of shamanic usage. And even though we're a very modest effort, it turns out we're the only people in the world, as far as we can tell, who are actually doing this. Um, you're all aware of the speed at which the rainforests of the world are being cleared. But what is never mentioned is the even more rapid disappearance of folk knowledge about the rainforest. I'm an optimist, and I believe that eventually the rainforest clearing will be halted, and there will be huge preserves in the tropics. But nothing will halt the homogenization of human knowledge and the abandonment of localized ancient folkways in favor of the kind of generic kinds of understanding that operate in the world cultural market. In the next 30 years, it's going to be the last opportunity that we will have to preserve 50, 100,000 years of folk medical knowledge relative to the tropics. So this is the real world political work that my wife and I do. And Kat runs it on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm its spokesman, but she does the the grunt work and the organizing and organizes the expeditions and the collections. If any of you are of a, philanth a philanthropic bent, this is uh, something I would be interested in discussing with you on our own. Uh, for the rest of you, I simply want to inform you that this kind of effort is going on. If you find yourself in exotic uh, foreign countries or planning to travel to remote tribal areas, uh, we would be interested in signing you up to help in our collection efforts. I believe that the collecting and preserving of these psychedelic and psychoactive plants is equivalent to the preserving of ancient manuscripts that was done in the Dark Ages. Preserving things we don't understand toward a brighter day when society will create an open enough climate of inquiry that these things can actually then be looked at. Well, so much for that. As far as uh, my qualifications, they're pretty minimal in the academic realm. I have a degree in conservation of natural resources from the University of California at Berkeley, which is a little like saying, uh, you know, I have a degree in tap dancing from the University of Antarctica. <laughs> but from the time that I was a very small child, I was uh, an edge runner. And I don't know why, but uh, this turned out to be a very fruitful natural style for getting ahead in the world. The exploration of edges, the oldest books, the forgotten countries, the unpronounceable islands, that sort of thing. And I was a rock collector and a butterfly collector, and an amateur rocketeer, and all these things. And when I analyzed these pursuits of mine, it was the pursuit of a certain flash of iridescence, the iridescence that you get when you break open ore-bearing rock, or the iridescence that you get when you capture certain kinds of butterflies in tropical environments or the kind of iridescence that you get when you mix potassium perchlorate and sugar in a uh, hot sauce pan and ignite it. In other words, pushing out at the edge of the permissible, at the edge of the probable, looking for a certain something, a scintilla, a spark, a possibility. And as I matured, 
and became uh, a goggle-eyed chess master and hell on wheels science fair competitor, I came to understand, I came to assimilate the methodology of science, which is not particularly uh, at the top of its uh, share of the market at the moment. But I assimilated that and I discovered the second part of the method that has been so serviceable to me, which is the good stuff can take pressure. The good stuff doesn't have to be looked at sideways. In other words, if something is real, you can stress it. You can test it. It doesn't require belief. This was, the, for me, a great intellectual watershed. The understanding that belief of any sort was a kind of encumbrance to the relationship that I was attempting to have with what I naively called reality. That was the thing. And eventually, uh, this strategy of edge running led me into psychedelics. I had had the good fortune to make my way to the University of California at Berkeley. So I was at, this was 1965, I was at ground zero of the cultural, impending cultural implosion. My good fortune. But at that point, discovering psychedelics, I realized that... Uh, not only the tired cliche that everything you know is wrong, but also that whatever is true cannot even be imagined. And since I discovered this on my own, I don't feel under any kind of constraint not to talk about it. I wasn't initiated by any secret society. Nobody swore me to silence. So I seem to have gotten through a number of filters. I feel perfectly empowered to talk about this thing which I think nobody is supposed to talk about. And I don't mean the legal side of it or the social side of it. I mean, that barely interests me at all. Who cares? I mean that the world we are living in is uh, not at all as the linguistic structures we have inherited would have us have it. That we are actually living inside some kind of artificial construction which is uh, potentially permeable by human understanding, but to date has not been. And we have been very much on the surface of things. The question that I raise constantly with myself, and it's interesting to talk about it with other people then, is, you know, just what is going on? <laughs> just what do you think is going on? I mean, have you backed off from it? Do you have a grip on the uh, outlines of the problem? Or are you just sort of adrift inside the context? Because the situation is mighty peculiar, friends. What we have here is a kind of creature made out of information, apparently loose in an environment of meaning, on the surface of a planet and upon which gene swarming is happening. And uh, all of these things, gene swarming, self-reflection, production of epigenetic codes like writing and this sort of thing, have no precedent. We don't go out and collect other forms of these things. They all are generated out of us. We, as moderns, as inheritors of Cartesian rationalism, look out at a universe that our science tells us is energy, matter, conservation of mass and momentum, and yet we never notice the peculiar enigma posed by the question, who's looking? Who's looking? How is it possible that 
the coextensive continuum of apparent being is coordinated inside organism into an experience of ongoing becoming with which we have some kind of identification. This is very weird. It should provoke more comment than it is. <laughs> It's, I, I think it's fairly easy to compress the entire history of philosophy into the process of achieving age eight. By age eight, most of us, if we have the time on our hands, are able to carry out an analysis of being where we reach the conclusion that everything is events in the nervous system. You know, I mean, we understand this. We understand that light being reflected from objects then creates neurochemical events, which reconstruct an image of the outer world. So we, we pay lip service to this idea that everything is a neurological event. But in fact, we have a very strong faith in the so-called three-dimensional Newtonian world. And yet, this is the faith that can be deconstructed on psychedelics. It shows us something which we give lip service to, but which is very hard to raise to the level of a felt experience. And that is that the world is made of language. It is made of language. This is not you know, something you say at sales meetings to boost sales. This is bedrock, as far as I can tell, and everything else is unconfirmed rumor. Well, then, you know, what is language? What is it if the world is made out of it? Well, then this becomes dicey, because the tool for describing language is language. And, you know, you don't have to have graduated to logic three to understand that there's a self-limiting a uh, program involved in something carrying out a complete description of itself. It's a tautology. It can't be done. Does that mean then that language can only be understood from the vantage point of the unspeakable? I think so. We didn't know what that meant. We thought the unspeakable was like silence. That isn't what it is. The unspeakable is the ground of language. Well, how did we get into this situation? This is part of the question that relates to what is going on. How did we get into this situation? If you, if you came in a flying saucer and observed the earth, I think you would come to the conclusion that the, the breakout process or the anomaly in the mix is the human element. Animals of all sorts have existed on this planet, integrated into all kinds of ecosystems. And only in the phenomenon of human beings do you get this breakout away from genetics, away from the raw transmission of hereditary characteristics, and into a whole new realm of being, a whole new ontos of possibility, which is epigenetics. Codes, self-generated, language, song, dance, uh, painting, chanting, all of these things are forms of expression, but they are not genetic expression. What seems to be happening on this planet, at least, and in the universe generally, is a conservation of complexity, a speeding up of process and a conservation of complexity. Now, the ordinary theory of evolution is thought to be a theory that is confined within the domain of biology. It's a theory of how one organism supersedes another and there is advancement of form. But scientists are very nervous when you extend the concept of evolution to the inorganic universe at large. And yet, if you think about the life of the universe, as we all have learned it from Carl Sagan, you know that we all began as an infinitely small, dense, hot dot 
but that didn't last long because there wasn't much going on because there was so much energy that no arrangements could be made. Then there was a massive explosion and a tremendous drop in temperature. And at that point, atomic, uh, you know, free atoms, electrons could settle into orbits around atomic nuclei and you get atomic chemistry, which condenses into stars made of pure hydrogen and helium, which cook out iron and carbon. You get more complex chemistry with more complex bond possibilities. This allows the molecular bond to form for the first time. Suddenly, an entirely new universe of possibilities springs into being. And at the end of that cascade of possibilities is organic life. Organic life then contorts and conserves information and folds it in upon itself and replicates it and distorts it. And you get more and more advanced forms of higher plant organisms, plants, and animals. Ultimately, this process ushers into human beings with culture, electronic culture, and then finally the cataclysmic connectedness of the 20th century. From a psychedelic point of view, this is all a connected process. You see, the Newtonian scientific thing lifted human beings out of the center of the cosmos properly and set them off to one side, small planet, small star, small galaxy, to one side. And that may have been a refreshing dose of realism to the monotheistic ego that had been created out of the medieval eschatology. But in a way, it's unsatisfying because the felt presence of experience has a centrality to it. I mean, we do feel that we are important at least to ourselves. Well, can we create a metaphysic that is true to what is observed of the universe and true to our intuition? Yes, we can if we see history as the inheritor and the culminating process of all these other processes. And then if we see ourselves installed at the cutting edge, at the leading edge of history, as its major players and actors. And this is, in fact, the situation. I mean, have you ever stopped to consider how many people didn't screw up for you to be sitting here tonight? You know, your ancestors, how many times there were opportunities for you know, the saber-toothed tiger to strike back or the hunt to fail or the fever to sweep through or the breast to go dry or how many times were there opportunities that somebody had their eye on the ball, somebody paid attention. You are the inheritor of that process. There's a lot of talk in the New Age, Mage, about the Tao of the ancestors. Or Tao. Well, what does the Tao of the ancestors mean except that you are the rearranged genetic component of your particular genetic stream and your grandfather, your great uncle, your grandmother, your great aunt had ways of doing things. Pitting peaches, planting beans, trimming flank steak. That's the Tao of the ancestors that there's a way to do things. And that when you do things that way, that is the appropriate way for you to do it. And you can tell it's the appropriate way because there is very little energy loss. That's what the Tao is. It is appropriate activity. And from a psychedelic point of view, when we analyze the state of the world, what we see is not that there are many problems, sexism, racism, air pollution, monotheism, you name it, not that there are many problems, but that there's really just one problem. The problem is, well, it can be defined many ways, but it's basically that we are inappropriate to ourselves. We are ill with ego. 
We have a narcissism that we cannot put down. Why? Why, given what we know about evolution and how it tries to smooth the way, why do we have a maladaptive relationship to reality? It doesn't make any sense. Well, here's why. <laughs> it's nobody's fault, first of all. It has to do with the fact that the monkey is lagging behind the dynamics of the planet. Three million years ago, we were happy in the trees of Africa, in the canopy, tropical equatorial forests of Africa. And in the way of planets, there are long cycles of drying and, and aridification. And a cycle like that began in Africa. And these are boreal primates, which had a social form and a complex kind of pack signaling. Uh, they were fruititarian and highly specialized at it, came under environmental pressure because of the retreat of these, of these rainforests and their replacement by grasslands. When an animal comes under environmental pressure like that, it has to expand its diet or face extinction. It's just that simple. Now, to my mind, the great unexamined uh, dynamic of evolutionary theory is diet, especially when we discuss human evolution. Why? It works like this. These monkeys are under pressure to expand their diet. Therefore, they must experiment with new kinds of food. When you experiment with new kinds of food, you are opening yourself up to exotic chemicals and mutagenic compounds present in plants in your environment. Plants produce these things to ward off predation, discourage insects, attract pollinators, various reasons. But chemically speaking, the very compounds which our pheromones, sexual attractants, or poisons are also in the chemical families that impact on human physiology. Alkaloids, steroids, hormones, uh, neurotransmitters, and yes, psychedelic drugs. These things are all present in the diet. Well, uh, human, the, the peculiar way in which we differ from the other primates, I mean, speaking generally, is that we are, have what are called neonatal characteristics. The persistence of infantile characteristics into adulthood is typical of human beings. This is why we have this extremely long period of uh, semi-non-functionability, up to age 16 or something. You're not fully all there, you know. This is incredible for an animal. This means we remain, we're almost like... Uh, uh, kangaroos. You know, when the kangaroo is born, it's an eighth of an inch long. It lives in the mother's pouch. It's actually out of the body in practically maggot form. And uh, our hairlessness and uh, our large skull and uh, numerous characteristics are neonatal and were probably induced by mutations, alkaloids and things like that in the diet. The one I want to particularly call to your attention is psilocybin, because here is the scenario of human emergence, and I defy anyone to top it. This is how it happened. Here's how the boar ate the cabbage, or something. Part of this pressure to expand diet had to do with abandoning vegetarianism and turning on to the fact that there were huge amounts of protein on the hoof in these grasslands in the form of ungulate mammals that were developing in the same environment. So these pack hunting primates began to take an interest in these ungulate mammals and, you know, hunt them, club them, and, or, or predate on uh, carrion kills by lions and that sort of thing. And when they did this, of course, if you follow herds of ungulate animals, you see a lot of what the president calls deep doo-doo. 
And in this, you encounter mushrooms. The technical term is coprophilic, dung-loving, somewhat like the president. And uh, these dung-loving, coprophytic mushrooms contain psilocybin. Well, if you've ever been in the veldt environment or in any environment where this, these pasture mushrooms are happening, they're extremely noticeable in the environment. I mean, I have seen them in the Amazon the size of dinner plates, and you can see them, you know, from 300 yards away in a pasture. Also in Kenya, I've observed personally pack hunting baboons, and what they're into are grubs that locate under cow pies. And so their technique is to run around flipping over cow pies and picking up weird things and smelling and tasting them. This means that the mushroom is planted directly in the evolutionary path of these evolving primates. They're moving onto the grasslands, they're following the herds, they're looking for the game kills, and they're encountering mushrooms and testing them for uh, food value. Okay, very simple three-step process. When you take psilocybin, in very small amounts, amounts so small that subjectively you don't notice anything. Roland Fisher did tests in the 1960s, and he showed, using rats and later graduate students, <laughs> that... Uh, <laughs> that small amounts of psilocybin actually increase visual acuity. And he gave people eye tests, a particular kind of eye test where there were two parallel bars, and by turning a crank out of sight of the test subject, you could deform these bars so they were no longer parallel, and the subject would push a button when they felt the bars had moved out of parallel. No question. The very slightly stoned people could pick this up much faster than a, an ordinary person. Okay, you don't have to be an evolutionary biologist to know that if there's a plant in the environment of a hunting animal that will improve the visual acuity of that hunting animal, then those animals that admit that into their diet are going to outbreed the other individuals who don't admit it into their diet because they're going to have more success at hunting, which means more food, which means more uh, babies and more successful adults, so forth and so on. First step. Second step, slightly more psilocybin. Now what happens? Psilocybin is an indole hallucinogen like LSD, bogaine, um, so forth, uh, beta-carbolines. DMT. Okay, it's a CNS activator. That means that it is going to cause CNS arousal. Forget CNS. It's going to cause arousal. <laughs> Forget arousal. That means erection. Okay, so in the mid-range dose on psilocybin, it's causing an interest in sexual activity. Increased generalized arousal, but it's an itch you can't scratch and you usually settle down to getting laid. I mean, this is just how arousal works. Okay. So then, at slight, and now what is this doing? This, it, it's like a, it's like a, 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 an aphrodisiac or something in the food chain of this animal. Well, what is it doing? It's causing more of what primatologists call uh, successful copulations. And these successful copulations are happening in the presence of an increased food source because of the increased visual acuity. So you see what is happening. The factors are beginning to snowball that will favor the, the, the outbreeding of the non-mushroom using part of the population. Well, then at still higher levels of psilocybin ingestion, you get the full-blown psychedelic ecstasy, which even we as moderns with Heidegger and Husserl tucked under our arm, we don't know what the hell's going on. We are as primitive in the face of it as people in the Magdalenian were. So, but it introduces the notion of a transcendent other, a tremendum, a translinguistic reality, the experience of the logos, the unspeakable, in other words, religion. So here's a three-step process. 
Increased success in hunting brings increased food supply, which brings increased sexual activity, which brings higher birth rate, which is all happening in the ambiance of this tremendous psychedelic experience. Now, I think that that alone is sufficient to make the case that it must have been indole alkaloids in the early human diet that catapulted us into this extraordinary relationship to language and cognition that we have. But there's more to it than that, because we just have been glossing this thing that we call the psychedelic experience. After all, what is it? Well, then when you try and go into it and say, what is it? Uh, I think that, that a, a number of issues are coming together that may not have appeared to be related. The hysteria over drugs in our society, the apparent approach of the end of all life as we know it on this planet, and our political wrongheadedness. Well, now, what does all this have to do with a hypothesized relationship of proto-humans to a food source in the belts of Africa a million years ago? Well, I just prefer this kind of big picture analysis. That's it. <laughs> and, and what I think happened is that if you, if you know anything about monkeys, they are not very pleasant creatures. Uh, they have a, a male dominance hierarchy, what's called an alpha male primate, and he kicks everybody around and keeps the good women for himself and the good food and so forth. And so, As we look at lower primates, it's a fairly discouraging picture. But I believe that shamanism in its heyday was you know, not the feeble curing of psychological ailments that we grant uh, uh, to shamanism on the borders of the third world today, but that it was a deeper understanding of nature and humanity than we possess right now. And that what the high shamanism of the Paleolithic did was it put us into a quasi-symbiotic relationship with the mind of the earth, if you can grok this, that there is actually a chemical network of communication, that the, the earth is a living organism, yes, but it's also a reflected-minded organism. And this is beyond what Lovelock and all those people are willing to say. This is not based on science. This is based on the experience of meeting the management on the other side of science. <laughs> the earth is some kind of conscious intellect, and it is managing itself toward an end. We are embedded in a plan. We are not a breakaway mutation. We are a desperate response to something. And what was going on back there in the high Paleolithic was, uh, on a very regular basis, human beings in this nomadic hunter-gatherer situation were taking mushrooms together as a religious ritual. They were dissolving boundaries. This is what we experience when we take psilocybin. The generalized description of the psychedelic experience is it dissolves boundaries. And the main boundary that it was dissolving and that it does dissolve is the ego. Psychedelics are an inoculation against selfishness at the expense of group values. And it is selfishness at the expense of group values that is shoving us toward Armageddon. These pastoralist, mushroom-taking, goddess-worshipping, equilibrium, partnership societies were the solution to the human problem. They had achieved a kind of dynamicist that we can only envy. They were fully minded. Their thoughts were deeper than our thoughts. Their poetry was richer than our poetry. They didn't build things. They didn't have a demonic relationship to matter. 
because, because every new and full moon they were taking mushrooms and jumping on each other in a big heap. And this was making it impossible to trace male paternity. And so care of children was generalized. It was a group phenomenon. And so then what happened? If it was so wonderful, what the hell happened? Well, again, no blame, no blame. What happened was that the very processes that created this perfect world, which were a process of gradual drying of the African continent to force these monkeys out of the trees and into this grassland, symbiotic, pastoral, nomadic adaptation, that drying process continued. And the grass dried up and the water holes got further and further apart, and the mushroom festivals were no longer held every Saturday night. They were held once a month, and then at the solstices and equinoxes, and then at the solstice, and then every 10 years, and then never. And the other thing that was going on was there was frantic pressure to try and figure out how to preserve the mushrooms since they were so hard to get. And the only solution anybody could come up with was honey. And honey is a material which left to itself in that kind of an environment will turn into mead. And mead is an alcoholic beverage. And the difference between a psilocybin cult and an alcoholic beverage is the difference between church and North Beach. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so around, uh, around 9,500 years ago, it, it wouldn't work in Africa anymore. It was insupportable. And these people began moving out into the Nile Valley and what is now Palestine. And if you know anything about the archaeology of the Nile, you know that before this, it, the stratigraphy is basically empty. He, then, he slays the cosmic bull. Then he goes to the shaman figure, Enkidu, and against his will, he puts big pressure on Enkidu to go with him into the wilderness. And there, they cut down the tree of life. This is what they do. This is what Gilgamesh does. This is the first act of the first man in the first moment of the story of Western civilization, out into the woods to chop down the tree of life. Meanwhile, the Semite, their story is a story of history's first drug bust. You know, this woman finds this plant. The caretaker of the garden has put up signs which say, don't eat this plant. She eats it and the shit hits the fan. And I recommend to you a thorough reading of Genesis. It's astonishing what's going on there. Here we have Yahweh after this little contretemps has taken place. Yahweh He's wandering around in the garden. He speaks. Don't ask me to who. He speaks and he says, if they eat of the fruit of the tree of life, they will become as we are. This, this can't fly. So the issue is, everybody perceives the issue the same. Adam, Eve, and Yahweh. The tension is over the fact that there would be equality. If the plant knowledge were fully available, and it's clear that it comes through the woman, I think that women were the custodians of language. I think language was a woman's mystery. Uh, the again, looking at it from a point of view of evolutionary stress, the evolutionary stress on men was to be the stoic, silent hunter to be able to hold a hunting position in a game drive for hours. And women stayed closer to home because they had children hanging off them. They had a different physical constituency. And they were in charge of the gathering part of the hunter-gatherer equation. Well, gathering is, about, is essentially the art of description. It's the small bush with the silver leaves at the bottom of the arroyo near the black rock with the gray scratch across it. You, know, you have to have your language skills down. You have to be able to describe hundreds of plants and their parts 
and where they're located and how to separate them and how to prepare them and what part of year is important and so forth and so on. And this repertoire of detail was what women had and what created them their power in this goddess uh, mushroom ambiance. The thing that I've learned in studying history and living life is that the thing that makes you happy eventually makes you unhappy. Everything flows. Nothing lasts. And this is a hard truth to come to grips with, psychedelic or otherwise. Nothing lasts. Nothing lasts. Not even yourself. And what failed for the archaic world was the cleverness of women evolved into the potential understanding of agriculture. They had this vast repertoire of understanding of plants, but when they abstracted it and generalized it, they realized, we don't need this. We just need to utilize what we know about these six plants and forget all this other stuff and lean hard on these six plants. Well, but then everything is... Uh, you know, you're not gathering now. You're setting plow to the earth. You're wounding the earth. And, you know, from there to this moment, it's just the blink of an eye. It's that wonderful camera dissolve in 2001 where the bone is thrown into the air. And as it comes down, it turns into a space station in orbit around the earth. The rest is history, as they say. History is the story of the cancerous and unchecked growth of the ego its institutions, its structures, its stratagems, its ploys. It's worked every single angle. And I, I think that monotheism is appealing philosophically as a certain economy. One God, you know, that wraps it up nicely. <laughs> but, you know, you've got to be a little more subtle than that. Uh, let's take a Jungian perspective for a moment. Our gods are the images that we collectively empower ourselves to emulate. And if our God is omnipotent, omniscient, never wrong, always right, utterly unforgiving, this is a jerk. <laughs> Who needs this? We don't need this. Our image of deity is pathological. Our image of deity is the image of the cancerously untamed ego. And until we uh, do something about this, we haven't got the prayer of a snowball in hell. Exhortation is not going to do it. And now time is running out. Time is running out. It was not for nothing that this psychedelic surge occurred in the 60s. This, the human story is not going to be allowed the luxury of being a comedy. You know what a comedy is? A comedy is when you've got no choice. This is going to be a tragedy because the cards are on the table. You know, if you drown because this boat is sinking, it's because you didn't bother to wander over and climb in the lifeboat. That's the kind of situation we're in. By analyzing the archaic context, which was the last sane moment this species ever knew, so what that it was 15,000 years ago? It's a blink of an eye. No, we've been ill since then. Now let's fix it. The last sane moment we ever knew. And then comes the cascade of history. History is an absolute nightmare. And it can only be redeemed by us. This is this thing about the Tao of the ancestors. You know, did all these people get freeze to death and stomped on by mastodons and eaten by saber-toothed tigers and ravaged by disease so you can blow it? You with your Mercedes and your 48-foot television set? It can't be that lame, you know? 
So, so then how does one, what is to be done, right? The Tolstoyan question. What is to be done? Is it a political program? Is it, what is it? I don't think it is that. I think that, that the way the psychedelic thing works is you must establish a level of authenticity in yourself vis-a-vis -vis reality. And then you become a walking social catalyst, regulator, meme generator, whatever you want to put it. It's, it's authentic understanding without ideology. This is it. Psychedelics are not an ideology. Psychedelics are an experience. I mean, you can have the psychedelic experience without taking drugs. It's just that, you know, you have to drive your car 100 miles an hour over a 300-foot cliff and live. <laughs> you know, and then you come out of that ready to talk turkey. <laughs> but, you know, <clears throat> we lose too many people that way. <laughs> because, you see, what we're in is serious denial. I mean, the, the capacity of the Western mind for denial of the predicament is just mind boggling. I mean, here we are calmly discussing, the clock is ticking and we're sitting on a planet stuffed full of thermonuclear bombs, disease uh, delivery systems, crazo politicians, psychopaths at every organizational level, propaganda machine running wild. And we intellectuals calmly gather to, again, consult Tolstoy, consult this, consult that, try and figure it out. The level of denial is pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, I think we have to go back to the 60s to see why that's the case. It's because we're very much afraid. The issue around psychedelics, both, both collectively and personally, if you're doing them right, is surrender. You know, if you're doing them right, it scares you to death how much you do. Because you do so much that you lose control. That's the thing. Control is the issue, always and everywhere. And we've got this scene so controlled that you know we're on the brink of Armageddon behind control. How can it be very, very carefully deconstructed? Well, I think the first thing is we have to open a pipeline to the logos. We have to reach the goddess mind behind nature. And this means following the classical prescriptions of shamanism. It's true what they say. What the shamans say is truer than anything we can say about them. In other words, it's not that they're putting it through a language filter or that they're epistemologically naive or some horse shit like that. That's not it. It's you who are epistemologically naive. And me, we have no idea what is possible in nature, in positions of courage and high intoxication. So the, uh, I see the whole 20th century as a very, you know, it's like trying to turn a battleship with an oar. It's very, very slow going. But with Freud and Jung, we get the discovery of the unconscious. I mean, they discover it through a spyglass at 900 yards, but they do announce that it's out there. And then, uh, you know, through surrealism, abstract expressionism, psychedelic drugs, so forth, we are now exploring this domain. We, the analogous cultural crisis is the uh, late 15th century, the 1490s. Printing was invented in Mainz in 1440. By 1492, the New World had been discovered. We, it, it's 1490. We need to go somewhere. We don't know quite where, but you can almost taste it. What it is, is that we, I think, are getting set 
to take flight into what has always been our destiny. We're special. We are not outside the plan, but we're in a loop of the plan that the rest of organic nature is not participating in. We are the hands of the planetary mind. And the technologies that we have assembled are for the purposes of the planetary mind. Surely it must sense the finite nature of the life of the planet and the star itself. We are a kind of strategy for moving energy around. Someone once said, animals are a strategy invented by plants for moving seeds around. Well, I think human beings are a strategy invented by nature for catalyzing natural process. Clearly, the whole planet is being sped up. We are preparing to depart for a dimension which can only be called the imagination. This is what culture is. 8,000 years ago, when we began to crowd into cities and build walls and define everything into grids and mandalas, that was the beginning of the excrescence of mental space. That's what we're living in. These are all ideas. This was just unorganized matter put through the mills and presses of design to create a world that reflects the world that is living on the other side of our foreheads, the world of our imagination. But it has always operated against the background of the laws of physics. You know, the strength of materials, the laws of gravity. You just can't build bridges with spans more than X or skyscrapers taller than Y. But in the imagination, wishes are horses, beggars ride. And this is the cultural dimension that we have a potential to create. I don't think that there's a way to manage this thing back down into the equilibrial pastoralism of 20,000 years ago. We burned those bridges. It's a real crisis. We will not recognize our grandchildren. The metaphor that gives me hope when I look at the world is the metaphor of birth. That must be what is happening. I mean, if you were suddenly to come around the corner of a building and encounter someone giving birth, the entire ambiance is of crisis, at least, if not alarm. I mean, pain is being felt, blood is being shed, anguish at high volume is being expressed. It's crisis. If you've never seen it, how could you believe that this was an ordinary part of existence scripted into being as a necessary part of its happening at all. It, it wouldn't take you like that. And yet that's what is happening here. The mother and the child have now reached the moment where they must be parted. If they're not parted, toxemia will set in. This is bad for the child, bad for the mother. I'm not comfortable with this. I don't like this Gnostic thing of leaving the earth behind in any sense, even if we just descend and become the size of grains of salt and live at the center of the earth or something. It still means we're going to leave everything that we know and love and understand behind. But nevertheless, you know, you reach these places in your life. The birth canal is the first one. Leaving home is the next one. And you know, there are many leavings. It's just that this is a big one. We will never be the same. The earth will never be the same. And like the fetus, or the, yes, poised at the head of the birth canal, we don't know where we're going. We really don't see light at the end of the tunnel. And neither does the fetus. This is the surrender issue. It's going to get crazier. 
they they were so relieved when the craziness stopped after October and November and December. But don't be fooled, it was just a, a hesitation. The craziness is intensifying and intensifying. I believe that the transcendental object that is actually causing the lower dimensional phenomenon, which we call reality, that the transcendental object is coming tangential to the historical continuum, that that's what this is all about, that a hundred years from now, the earth will be empty of people. There won't be a one, not a one. I mean, the breeze will move the grasses. Uh, we will be gone. Where? Huh. Guess, who knows? Here's hoping. We have to find the door because the place is filling up with shit. It's very simple. And there are many doors. Here's a door. Extinction. How do you like them apples? If you can't find any other door, nature will kick open that door and push you right through it. And yet, you know, we possess creativity on a scale undreamed of. We can find a way out. There's no problem. We have the technologies, the money, the resources. We have everything we need except the will. It's a mental quality lacking in us. The will to do it. The will to undertake planetary sized projects. The will to make a plan that has a 20-year, a 50-year, and a 500-year benchmark. But we are going to have to very quickly cease our infantilism. And this brings me around to the fact that we are forever infantile if we do not avail ourselves of the psychedelic experience. It is on a par with sex. It makes my flesh crawl to imagine someone going from birth to the grave without ever having sex. Fortunately, life is scripted in such a way that few escape <laughs> this edifying experience, which most, if you question them around age 11, would seek to avoid. Well, the psychedelic experience is not made inevitable, except by death, if you insist on waiting that long. <laughs> but a, a mature exploration of life includes it because it shows you who you are. It gives you a conducted tour of the captain's quarters. You may not have even known the captain's quarters existed. Now, how much is your ignorance worth to you? We need to eliminate the unconscious mind. This is really what it comes down to, folks. We cannot, in an era of 30-minute delivery of thermonuclear weapons from anywhere to anywhere, we do not have the luxury of carrying around with us an enraged bull primate. We cannot afford the luxury of the unconscious the hidden motive, the unexamined drive, the misunderstood uh, acquisition. The only way we can correct our cultural situation is by returning to an archaic style. This is what societies always do when they're slammed to the wall. When the medieval world blew up on itself, they returned to the classic models of Rome and Greece and created classicism. Classicism was created in the 15th century, for God's sake. There hadn't been a Roman around for a thousand years. When a society gets into trouble, it reaches back. We've got trouble in River City, big trouble. And we have to reach further back, further, further. Egypt won't do. The Nazis tried that. It won't do. We have to go back to this high archaic shamanism. And it's a hard swallow for individuals and society, because we have made illegal this possibility because it is threatening to the dominance of the ego. 
the ego cannot coexist in the presence of a psychedelic religion or a psychedelic option. To my mind, this is the real issue behind this asinine drug war. Nobody is going, we're not going to have an epidemic of heroin addiction or cocaine abuse if they legalize all this trash. That's ridiculous. But we are going to have people experimenting with psychedelics if all drugs are legalized. And that's absolutely terrifying to any establishment. You know, Marxists, George Bush, you name it, anybody who's got a stake in order is appalled at the notion that someone would examine the understructure and undercarriage of the social engine. They're not interested in that. That's what has to be done. We need a thorough revisioning of reality, a thorough recommitment to a revitalization of religion based on experience, not on the cant of priests, but on an experience. And, you know, there's all kinds of stuff in the spiritual market place, yoga and spirulina diets and colored lights and this. This is all, as far as I'm concerned, malarkey. I mean, these things do things. They move you around, altered states. My God, there are thousands of altered states. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, simultaneously shitting white with tears of joy streaming down your face because of the intensity of the proximity of the mystery. And, uh, it's not difficult. It merely requires courage. Whoever went in to the ashram with their knees knocking with terror over what the next yoga session would bring. I mean, give me a break. It's, we're talking about the real thing, and you know what the real thing is. And uh, it's, it is assimilated by an act of courage and an act of responsibility and uh, an act of understanding. If we commit ourselves back to this archaic thing, to the mind behind nature, it is, uh, it is, our, it is our home, our birthright. I think of the human race as someone who became separated from their mother's hand in a department store for 15,000 years. And we've been running from department to department. You know, is it tennis rackets? Is it bicycles? Is it sleds? What is it? Shoot it, chew it, this and that. No, <clears throat> no. We have to return to an authentic psychedelic shamanism that is rooted in our experience, if we empower our experience, we will cease to be the easily manipulated democratic masses. Do you know what democratic masses, do you know what kind of an insult that is to you and me to be called the democratic masses? Uh, if we empower ourselves and become reacquainted with the authentic dimension within us, then we won't put up with this crap anymore. This is what happened in the 1960s. People wouldn't put up with it anymore. And they poured into the streets and raised, holy hell, scared everybody to death. Why wouldn't they put up with it anymore? Because they saw how shoddy, chintzy, and knocked together it is. We've been sold a pig in a polk. It's not worth having. These things don't make us happy. They don't bring us wisdom. They don't give us death. It's an infantile, insulting, ridiculous society, except that it's holding a gun to the head of every living thing on this planet. Shamanism with courage and commitment is, as far as I can see, uh, the last best hope of mankind. Otherwise, there is no hope. In other words, I'm not saying this is easy or now you've heard me say this, so we're going to save the world. No, I give us a one chance in 50, and, but this is the only game in town. You know, Helmut Kohl isn't going to do it, not Gorby. Nobody. Those guys are caught in their own definition. Nothing changes people like psychedelics. 
And changing people is what we've got to do, ourselves and other people, fast. Thank you very much. We'll take an intermission, then I'll come back for questions. That's the good part. Thank you. So let's just take questions uh, and we'll go for a while. Before we begin, there's just one thing I want to say, a point that I want to make, which is uh, I say it in all situations where I come to a place like this for the first time. Maybe you all do know each other. I get the feeling this is a small town. But anyway, psychedelic people look like everybody else. And the one good purpose served by these events is that they draw them out of the woodwork. So you might look around and see who your affinity group is. Uh, odds are, whatever you need, someone in this room has it. <laughs> whatever you need. <laughs> okay, so much for clowning around. Yes. Um, as a parent of, of a teenager and several other children, I felt a responsibility to bring my oldest daughter here tonight. These, these same substances that we're talking about are out on the plaza on the streets of Santa Fe, and children are using them in ways that I think need guidance. Um, could you speak to that? Yes, sure. I'm glad to. This is an excellent question. I have um, a boy 11, a girl 9, so I'm meeting this as well. What do you say to your kids about this issue and about drugs generally? Um, there's no, the main thing about drugs is a lack of education. I mean, we have to educate people about drugs, and we have to tell them the truth. And the truth unfortunately, is complex. So how do you tell a kid a complex truth? You know, I mean, uh, the Surgeon General says tobacco is as addictive as heroin. Tobacco you get from a machine, heroin, they send you up the river for years. How do you make sense of this for a kid? All I know to do is, first of all, I don't hide anything I do from my children. And, and I think it's a bad idea. I actually make a character judgment. I don't think people should hide what they do from their children. This, we can't light up a J till the children are in bed stuff, is malarkey. Because it's, it's giving a message of subterfuge and confusion. It means you'd have no principles. You don't know where you stand on this. You're all over the map. In fact, you look like an addict to something. So why don't you just, uh, you know, be out front about it? The other thing is, it's just like sex and all these tricky things that you come to with children. You try to give a good example, try to give the best information that you can, and, um, you know, stand back and hope. But I really think the main thing is openness and education. And I say to my kids, you know, if you want to try something, discuss it with me. If you get past me, I'll get it for you. So, you know, don't be out on the street. We'll make sense of it together, whatever decision we come to. That's great. That's exactly right. Well, it's not very satisfying, but I don't know what else to do. You know. Back there. And then my question is... Uh, you have talked about all the very positive things that psychedelics can do, and you have talked very well about it. You have expressed many wonderful truths. <coughs> but then the other side of the coin is what do you do or how do you deal with such occurrences as, for example, Charlie Manson uh, and uh, psychedelics being used for satanic purposes. The question of a Manson or something like that, I don't really, I don't deal with that because I regard it as anomalous. But what I hear you asking is, what about the dark side of psychedelics? And I think that's certainly worth talking about. Um, it isn't a joy ride necessarily. 
one thing that is quite wonderful about psychedelics is that, uh, and I'll just speak of the mushroom in this case, is that it's wonderfully kind to beginners. But if you are a, a, an acolyte of the priesthood, sooner or later, it will scare the socks off you. And in many ways, it can do this. In fact, that's what's so scary about it, is it knows the way to scare you, just like it knows everything else uh, about you. And um, so, so in my talk, I stress the facility with which one can access these places, and I sort of teased yoga. It is easy to access these places. The question is then, but is it easy to control and manipulate and understand these places? And this is where it can turn you every way but loose. This is where you want to have your mantras polished and your yantras ready. Because uh, in that domain, it all works. All that malarkey that doesn't ever work anywhere else. In that domain, it works. And, uh, and so... I think one should have techniques, uh, you know, the ring pass knot or mantras, uh, something that you have faith in, power objects. Ultimately, the best advice I've ever come on, and, you know, it's pretty sickening advice, but the goal is to survive these things, uh, is Frank Herbert's advice in Dune about fear. And he says, fear comes like a wind. It comes, and the way you meet it is you meet it, and you wait, and it blows, and it blows, and it blows itself out, and then you're alone again, and that's what you have to do. And then in terms of practical uh, instruction, there are way, ways to navigate through hard spots, breath control, singing. Singing is wonderful. We tend to suffer silently. And if you get into a, a pressurized place on a psychedelic, I don't think it's a good idea to go to squeeze down and to meet it like that. I think it's much better to sing, to you know, circulate huge volumes of oxygen through your body and just send your whole metabolism spiraling off in some other uh, direction. Shamanism was defined by the foremost uh, commentator on it, Mersiliad, as the archaic techniques of ecstasy. Notice its techniques. And this is really important. Uh, this is not a religion or an ontology or a set of beliefs like Buddhism, Hinduism, Catholicism, you name it. It's a set of techniques and the techniques deliver the experience. And then out of the experience, one creates whatever models of the universe seem appropriate. But uh, th this is what science was before science. This is what religion was before religion. And it's deep. It's the deepest thing there is. Our society, living in ignorance of this, is infantile and destructive and narcissistic and materialistic and the whole gamut because we can't touch the gold in life. You know, it's hard for us. It's very elusive. It's far from us. Authenticity is fleeting and we require psychotherapists and self-affirmation, all this stuff to hang on to it. But th this was... Uh, this is, was understood and is there. I mean, my, how I got into this, like the gentleman who asked the question, is by being in the Amazon, by having searched India to see, so, you know, what can you show me? And they couldn't show me anything. They wanted me to sweep the ashram for 12 years, and then something wonderful was going to happen. And I, and, but then when I got to South America, I said, what can you show me? And I said, let's sharpen our machetes. We'll go out here and get some of this snake vine and come back, and I'll show you. 
And by 10 o'clock that night, you know, I was sobbing in the guy's arms. He'd shown me I was a convert. I'd sweep his courtyard for 12 years without asking. <laughs> Anyway, yes. yes. Would you speak more about your ayahuasca experiences in the Amazon? Sure. For those of you who don't aren't aware of, I think there's high awareness in this town, but ayahuasca is uh, a hallucinogenic uh, plant and beverage made of that plant with others. It's slow-release DMT. What's happening is DMT is being combined with an MAO inhibitor to make it orally active, which would not ordinarily be the case. And it's a slow-release DMT trip that lasts from four to six hours. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, it's been, it's existed in the Amazon for a long, long time. No one knows how long. I'm at work on a paper arguing that uh, Mayan religion, that it reached as far up as Chiapas, this cult at one time. And uh, what's interesting about it is it's a little different from psilocybin. Psilocybin has this millenarian high-tech, outer space, insects driving strange machines kind of thing to it. Ayahuasca is not like that. It's all about um, water and flow and life and organic and suspension of liquids and miscible layers of flowing color. And it's wonderful. It's quite feminine. It, it doesn't speak the way ayahuasca does, but you become like a camera's eye. You just become a, a roving eye, a moving eye, seeing in incredible things. And uh, it had a reputation when it was first uh, discovered. The alkaloid was isolated and named telepathine because it was felt that there were group states of mind going on. And uh, I, I, this is so... This is happening. I mean, this is what you want to talk about shamanism. This is what it's about. These people, upriver, bare-ass people, not people working in sawmills, but the still uncontacted or barely contacted people, the elders take this stuff together, and they rise into a higher dimension of social data, is the only way to put it. In other words, they see the the group, the predicament in a hyperdimensional matrix of some sort where weather and game levels and social relations with other groups and all this stuff are factored in and then collectively they make a decision. And I, I went to the Amazon very interested in this because I think that part of what this whole incipient breakthrough that we're talking about is about is what I call an ontological transformation of language. I believe that language is something which, when done right, you look at it. You don't hear it. When language is correctly performed, it is something seen. And this is one of the arts of the high Paleolithic that we have lost. We speak a barbarian speech, ear speech. Ear speech is, uh, has a very shallow depth of signal. And these hallucinogenically, these societies rocked in the cradle of hallucinogenic ecstasis through their shamanism were living in a kind of poetic hologram, culturally created poetic hologram. This is what all this talk about the poetry of high antiquity is attempting to reference, you know, all this talk about the Celts and the tremendous accomplishments of Thracia and Yugoslavia. It's, it's that language before male dominance, the phonetic alphabet, monotheism, and all this other stuff, confining cultural effects. Language was something that you see. And when we take hallucinogens under group circumstances where there is an intent to have that kind of a linguistic experience, it occurs. It's just under the surface. 
It's in our biological organization, but somehow damped by our cultural organization. Something we have to learn. Well, this is what uh, shamans knew in high antiquity. It's what the peculiar interdimensional beings that I call self-transforming machine elves teach. It's what the entities in the other dimension, the so-called spirit helpers, the allies, I call them the tykes, these things, this is what they teach, a new ontos of language, an ontos of language beheld. Can you imagine if you could see what I mean, how close that would make us, how in fact, if you could see what I mean, we would be the same person. Because seeing is so intimately connected with our definition of who we are that we place no, uh, um, oh, what do I want to say, leans against it. We accept what we see. That's why when we talk about perfected speech, someone doing a good job talking, we say he spoke clearly. It's a visual metaphor. Or we say to them, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. It means that for us, authentic meaning is beheld. This is because this is how we did it until we fell into history. History is the realm of the lower dimensional language slice, among other things. <laughs> yes, someone else. Yes. Um, in, in terms of language and the visual, don't you think there's a genetic connection with the symbols in the air? I mean, it would be the young men archetypes. But to me, it seems very genetic the way those images have crossed cultures totally historically. I'm not sure whether I agree or not. Yes, to some extent. I mean, for instance, there are these repositories of imagery, and I, being Celtic, get these Celtic images, but then also I hit nodules of Mayan imagery, and I'm pretty sure there's no Mayan genetic stuff floating around in my situation. I confess, I don't know, it's hard to make sense or to get a metaphor together that can encompass the psychedelic experience. I mean, for example, here's a game that can be played on ayahuasca if it's stiff. Uh, and that is, <clears throat> you can just say to the on the onrushing stream of vision, uh, Art Deco. And suddenly, there will be thousands of ashtrays, cigarette lighters, candy serviettes, stirring sticks, cocktail, all tumbling toward you in black space. And then you can say, you know, Italian Baroque. And here it comes, you know, these bleeding Madonnas and all this gold brocade. And, well, that's pretty. Then you can say to it, hey, Surprise me. <laughs> and, and the level of surprise and will begin to rise until you say, you've surprised me enough. <laughs> well, well, it's a, the, the first two examples, Art Deco and Italian Baroque, these are coherent styles which uh, affected whole eras and involved the lives of hundreds of artists and so forth. Well, what's happening with number three, the surprise me? Where you've never seen anything like this before. Is it also potentially capable of seizing a decade or two by the throat and stamping every t shirt and belt buckle and with its kiss? And then, what are these things, these galaxies of stylistic motifs that you encounter in the hyperspace of the mind? Very bizarre. I confess, you know, there are no. I don't think this stuff has limits. I think we've hit uh, meaning's edge here. It's a tool. It's, here's what it is. It's for anybody who has ever defined life as a quest or a path or a search or a mystery, it's like you've hit the main vein. 
It is a path. It is a quest. There is a mystery. And when you get to the mystery, it's better than you thought it would be. It's better than you could think it would be. Hell, it's the mystery. That's what it is. And you say, I never thought. I doubted all the way. The whole time I was looking, I never thought. And yet, you know, and it pays back. And you don't have to sign up with the rattlesnake people and the men who wear dresses and all this clergy and dogma and malarkey. It's, that isn't it, you know. The mystery is real. It can take the heat. Can you? That's the question. How I do digress. <laughs> yes. I would like you to comment on uh, how these psychedelics uh, give us access to part of the mind that we don't even imagine and uh, how this can be used. Well, uh, the answer has different depths. The first answer is um, it's as though there were a nearby dimension that is made out of art, made out of art, great art. In one of these deep passes, which last about 20 minutes, you feel like you have seen more art than the human race has produced in the last 500 years. You, one person, the, the richness of our inner life is truly awesome. I mean, you know, when they sent that probe out to Jupiter and hung it above these storms 11,000 miles wide and that sort of thing, that kind of stuff is in your mind. We have been so sold down the river by materialism. I mean, we're living in a, a paradisical palace, and our task is to communicate this to each other. So the, um, the unifying and politically salvational aspect of psychedelics is that by showing us all this beauty, I think it allows secular, reasonable people to return to faith in the order of things. You know, this is real religion. This is why religion was created in the first place. Animals don't need religion unless there's something to respond to. And this is what it is, that there is a secret about this planet, about the way things are here, and that you find out the secret by digging in the sub-basement of your own mind. And then you come upon the lost records the true history of your family. And uh, it's as though, you know, I keep making these metaphors of dysfunctional relationships, but it's as though we are amnesic. We suffer from this dysfunctional relationship in prehistory, literally being torn from the arms of the goddess, plunged into male dominance by climatological catastrophe, and, uh, and then left to wander and we have, we're haunted by this sense of, of, a, of a perfect world somehow lost, of a, of a way of being somehow sensed, and, you know, and then all these religions are hammering at us, do it this way, do it that way. And we're just uncomfortable in reality. And it's because we, we are amnesic. We have lost something. There is, the world is being pulled over our eyes. We are operating on one cylinder. We don't understand about how there is this tremendous, affectionate, helping intellecti that would like to help us through this for its sake as much as our own. So getting in touch with that and you can call it getting in touch with the other half of your mind or getting in touch with your unconscious or getting in touch with the planet or getting in touch with the, you know, overmind in hyperspace. The point is there is an organized, intelligent universe of meaning that is trying to break through into the chaotic human world. It's the plan from the unconscious. And we are frozen, twisted, 
It's been a long, rough ride. We can hardly see straight. And yet, you know, we need to back down, step aside, and surrender. And the voices are being heard. We know what needs to be done. It's that ideology must be abandoned. Nature must be served. The future must be served. I mean, these are hardly, uh, you know, argumentative positions, yet who the hell is taking them? And yet we must. So anything which is a, a catalyst to that kind of consciousness is, uh, is definitely in play here in, at the war at the end of the world. Yeah. Um, I want to tell you that I really love what you're saying, and uh, it's validated my perception, and I really appreciate it. Now, um, I've taken a lot of uh, psychedelics, and at a certain point, I became confused. Uh, it was very difficult for me to live within the morality of the society, um, to live within society, and, uh, you know, to function to live. So I would love to hear more of your personal experience of how you align taking psychedelics and living in the world. Thank you. Good question. The advice I would give you is don't say everything you think. <laughs> That's how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but, I mean, it, the question is an important one. Many times when I first started doing this in 83, 4, 5, after talks like this, people would come up to me and they would say, until I heard you talk, I thought I was crazy. And I've never told anybody any of these things that happened to me because my trips seem to be, other people seem to be having a good time. And what was happening to me was what you're talking about. And uh, part of the motivation for doing this is to build a community of agreement that can allow people to say, you know, the kinds of things that I say about self-transforming machine elves from hyperspace, and nobody reaches for a white telephone. You know, they say, oh, he's talking about that, or he's talking about his visions. In other words, to give people permission to have an inner life, a rich inner life, because uh, it, it's there. So building community and clarifying language is very, very important. You know, it's illegal to take drugs or sell drugs or whatever it is. So we don't really have much practice even building up among ourselves images of what we're talking about. Probably most people in this room, except for, well, and even them, I was going to say except for the cops, but even them, everybody in this room has a notion of what's going on when I say drug experience. Everybody says, oh, it's like the time I, but, but no, having had a drug experience doesn't qualify you for talking about psychedelics are thinking you understand them and even taking psychedelics doesn't qualify you for talking about them or thinking you understand them they they are not to be extrapolated from from anything else it is unique the fact that it's even called intoxication is a joke it, it's more as though there is a doorway into an, either another part of our mind or another part of the space-time continuum and I, I'm, you know, pretty Amish on this. It's a very narrow band of substances that do the thing that I find most fascinating. And you're certainly free to disagree with me. But I place great stress on vision, on hallucinations. And people say, well, why? It makes you feel good. You have great insights. Why are you always harping on vision? Because being sort of a reductionist, the visions are the part of it that convince me that it isn't me. Because I can examine the visions and say, <laughs> <laughs> but an emotion or an insight, 
that would be the point in saying that isn't me. But the, the visions are coming from somewhere else other than the self. Or if this is the self, then it's unrecognizable. The Jungian cartography did not set us up for it. It did set us up for what LSD is showing. But when you go deeper, like with DMT, the Jungian maps are useless. You don't know where you are, and you don't think anybody's ever been here before. I mean, there are no initials on the trees, let me tell you. <clears throat> so, so, part of, uh, so part of the answer to this what is to be done question and the political question and the question up here about integrating it into our lives, and what I'm trying to do, I mean, I should just be up front with you, is it's a very conscious and subversive effort to uh, goose along the evolution of language. We can't create a new world before, unless we can talk about it. And so the forced evolution of language, the forced and rational and designed expansion of the capacity of language is our best way to get out of this mess. We have problems we don't even know we have because we don't have words to talk about them. The psychedelics at operating on the social level, where we're talking about not my trip, your trip, but what does it do to millions of people, it uh, enriches language. It incites colorful speech. It provokes metaphor. Know what I mean? So that, and that's what it was doing way back then, and it gave us language and all these control languages that flowed from it. But now we can consciously contemplate that effect and attempt to engineer it and attempt to create languages that make these dimensions real, that give them a political consequence, that give permission to other people to think about them, to explore about them, to wonder about them. And by this means, very slowly, let us hope fast enough, attention will uh, evolve. And it's basically, you know, as fast as we each care to participate in this project. And it's not easy. See, the initial political challenge is, is to get stoned. And people resist that because they've got something to lose, or they think they've got something to lose. So it's uh, it's very tough political work. Uh, over here. Comment on what you just talked about. Language in itself is focused on metaphor, and metaphor is point where we're drawn. You agree? So far, um, it gives us something to use to work on my mind. It seems that in that metaphor, we're stuck. We can see it. Are we going to discover silence or song? That's what I think. I mean, I think that this, this visual language thing uh, needs to be thought about very carefully. For a long time, it seemed to me it was unbridgeable. It was a creature of my own imagination. But technologies exist. They're going to, and are being perfected that are going to allow us to see each other's aesthetic intent, you know, to, to be able to leave the foot, to follow the footprints of the artist through his own imagination in a kind of virtual reality. And I think probably we're headed for some kind of quasi-telepathic meltdown, and that the ego is, its life is limited, and we have no idea how profoundly this will affect each of us, because we may like to think we're new style, but when it comes to the real trans-techno-polymorphically perverse
fierce, multi-cyber human being. I don't know how many of us could cut the mustard. Yeah. <laughs> well, but I, I, I don't want to get into a dualism here. See, I think all terms are migrating toward each other. The, the drugs of the future uh, will be computers. The computers of the future will be drugs. One way of thinking of the historical enterprise is that what we're about here is we're trying to turn human beings inside out. We want to exteriorize the soul and interiorize the body so that the body becomes an image of some sort, freely commanded in a domain called the imagination. And the soul previously difficult to locate, becomes actually a cultural artifact. I imagine it rather like a polished silver disc. And, and that exteriorized soul becomes the new loca, loci of self-identification. Uh, you know, if any of you have followed Julian Jaynes' work, you know that he thinks the ego arose in Homeric times. That recently, 1500 BC, uh, Yeats in Sowing to Byzantium has this wonderful line, if something about, if ever out of nature I should be turned. It's all about becoming a jeweled object, a thing of gold and gold enameling to play for an emperor. It's the image of the transformation of the human soul into a technical object. And a lot of people get their hackles up at this point. The image which I think unifies all this stuff is the flying saucer. I mentioned in my main talk the transcendental object at the end of history, but nobody rose to the bait. The notion here you see is that uh, the reason things are so nuts is because we are actually in very close to some kind of temporal discontinuity. And the phenomenon of history itself is the shockwave of an eminent eschaton, if you will. In other words, the reason history exists is because of the nearby presence in time of a transcendental object, which I call the eschaton, which is casting a kind of lower dimensional shadow backward through time so that all these messiahs and aesthetic anticipations and prophecies and all this are distorted interpretations of this transcendental object. And the flying saucer is this as well. The flying saucer haunts time like a ghost. What is it? It's the cursor on God's reality processor. <laughs> if you've ever worked in word processing, you know that there's a little blinking thing called the cursor. And you move the cursor in the text to the place where you either want to put something in or take something out. And once you have made the excision or the inclusion, you move the cursor elsewhere in the text. And this is what the UFO is. It's, uh, it's a, um, it's like a ricocheting reflection of God's mind at the end of time. And to, to cross it, to, to come into its aura is to get this tremendous hit of the weird. This is what the weird is, as a matter of fact. The weird is the backward flowing casuistry from the object at the end of time. And the reason the 20th century is so fraught with contradiction, paradox, hope, horror, is because we are drawing tangential to this transcendental object. And every time you take a psychedelic, you are in eternity with the transcendental object. You see it you know, dead ahead 22 years and you're closing with it at the speed of light or something. Uh, and it is what causes the phenomenon of ourselves being drawn out of nature. We, there is a drama, there is a wooing, there is a royal marriage, an alchemical process underway. And we're the bride. 
and we are being drawn toward this union with this thing, which is what history was for. History is the placenta of this process to carry us to this moment of fusion where everything then falls together, makes sense, lifts off, closes down, and says goodnight. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Die hard. With uh, ayahuasca, do you, you have a sense of witnessing and that you have an experience when, when you take an ayahuasca or some kind of change? Ayahuasca is this, these moving walls and membranes. It's a labyrinth. Uh, it's, uh, the interesting thing about ayahuasca is chemically that it is made of neurohumoral substrate. Technically, there's no drug there. There's DMT and beta carbolines, both of which occur endogenously in human metabolism. It's a kind of brain cocktail. That's why it has uh, that's why it has evolutionary implications potentially. It's possible that we're that in the um, uh, metabolic pathways of the pineal, we're only a one or two gene mutation away from switching out an inactive cogener for a psychoactive cogener in that pathway. And in fact. This may have been traded off genetically through time. There may be shamanic lines. There may be people who have a facility for these things that is actually uh, uh, in the genes. The, the, to me, the most spectacular hallucinogenesis occurs under DMT. And DMT, it's interesting. It's worth talking about for a moment because it, too, is an endogenous neurotransmitter. Even though it's a Schedule One drug, everybody's carrying it all the time. You know, they don't need anything else on the books. We're all illegal <laughs> as we sit here. But what's interesting about DMT is it's the strongest of all these hallucinogens. I mean, and it comes on in a few seconds, 30 to 40 seconds. And yet it fades in a matter of four to five minutes. Well, now, what does this mean pharmacologically? You see, one way of thinking about a drug, if you're thinking, you know, trying to assess toxicity, is um, how long does the drug stay in your system? If, a, if you have rubbery knees and blurred vision 48 hours after doing something, it's garbage. You know, your body should be able to get rid of it. Well, DMT clears your system in three to seven minutes. It means it's like hurling an ice cube into a blast furnace. It means that when the DMT hits the synaptic cleft, these enzyme systems swing into action and say, oh, we understand what this is. We know how to dealkylate, deanimate, and shuttle this into harmless pathways like endoacetic acid. And then you come down almost as fast as it can be said. Yet, it's the most profound of all of these things conveys you instantly into a place so bewilderingly and titanically bizarre and profound that your jaw hangs in the air. You know, a place you never suspected existed, not a hint, not a jaw, not an iota, you never dreamed it was possible. And suddenly, there you are, you know. Well, this is profound information about the human organism about ourselves, about who we are. I mean, who are you if that can happen to you? It's a very mysterious part of you. We go back and probe the orgasm thing over and over again. But this is even this is much more intense, much more content laden. And yet what is all this content? These weird objects, where are they coming from? What does it mean? Who are these entities in there? Are they you know, wandering extraterrestrial do-gooders, uh, or, you know, is it humanity in a far-flung future trying to pull the chestnuts of the 20th century out of the fire? Or, you know, is it your dead grandmother? You can't figure it out. 
And yet, you know, it's really happening to you. You have to come to terms with it. And that, that to me, is the strangest thing about all of this stuff, is that it's real. It's like science fiction. It means that the world is science fiction. It means that there are things and places and possibilities going on that just read the mundane out. All those people who think the world is straight and rational and reasonable and squared off at the corners, they're just whistling past the graveyard. It is so wild and really out there that you just come back, you know, eyes round, jaw slung, because it's so peculiar and so near. I mean, this culture that we're living in is a tiny island a bulwark raised against the unspeakable, which is raging all around us. Hell, every time you hit the sack, it closes over you. And it's only through the grace of forgetting that we're able to reestablish it here. You know, this tiny little bubble of sanity. Well, yes, but what, what's going on in the rest of reality? Grab a clue. <clears throat> yes. Do you think that the virtual reality that my talk was about more? Do you think that a lot of people will have access to virtual reality or will it just be part of it? No, I think that it's possible. I, I'm uncomfortable with virtual reality. I'm just getting used to it. Are you doing it? I did it in order to write articles about it. I visited all these labs. I have the heaviest battle I had with my wife this year was over virtual reality and whether or not it's just another male mechano techno trap trip or my position that there might be something going on here. It's I don't like it that it's so machine like. On the other hand, all those machines could be shrunk down to the size of a sugar cube. Uh, for those of you who hate the idea of virtual reality, I have an argument that might sway you. Uh, I just saw a paper. God, I hope I'm, this isn't industrial proprietary information. But anyway, I just saw a paper where these people have a, a virtual reality system, but they want to slave it to a satellite navigation system so that it can locate wherever you are on Earth to within three feet. And then the proposal is all advertising will be made illegal in three dimensions and will be forced to go virtual so that you will have to be wearing glasses and you will see ordinary reality except all the signs will be there. But if you take the glasses off, the signs will have been taken down in 3D. No billboards in 3D. No advertising. No print of any sort. If you want to read the signs, you're going to have to buy the goggles. So there's an argument for uh, virtual reality. Yeah. You have that like that or virtual reality about that. Oh, see it. Okay. Oh, they can see it. My apologies. <laughs> well, let's see. One last question, and then you should go do something more interesting. I hope you can figure out what it is. Go into nature. Go into your own mind. I mean, the, the message is rising. The urgency is rising. And, uh, you know, if you have ears to hear, hear, and eyes to see, see, uh, in terms of what that means practically, and I suppose I should leave you with this thought, uh, do these things in silent darkness and do them with attention. Silent darkness. You don't need Bach or Moody Blues to skip it. Silent darkness. Let trust that your mind is richer than you think it is and study the darkness behind your closed eyelids with the expectation that you will see something and pay attention to breathing and, and sound, song. Open your mouth. Let air move through you. And, uh, Five grams of, of mushrooms in silent darkness. I'm telling you, it's it will make a believer out of you if you aren't already. Good luck. <laughs> uh, 
I think what these religions are doing is that they are and they are interacting with this same intuition. The grandiosity comes in the sense that I don't think we're dealing with the God who hung the stars like lamps in heaven, you know, what Milton said. Uh, that's some whole other scale. But what we're dealing with is something like the God of biology, that there is something on this planet that we have completely overlooked. I mean, look at the situation. We emerged from, you know, berry picking to photographing Europa in about uh, a million years. Well, life has been on this planet, higher animal life. I don't just mean algae and lichens and like that. I mean, higher animal life has been running around on this planet for uh, 300 million years. Well, how many, you know, biology is a, is a engine of strategies. How many peculiar byways of evolution might be pursued, explored, and then perhaps quenched on that kind of a time scale. So we assume the only kind of intelligence there can be is our kind. But then the psychedelic uh, introduces us, and then we have a limited number of choices. After you fiddle with psilocybin for a while, the question of whether or not there is an alien intelligence becomes moot. There is an alien <laughs> intelligence. And then the question is, what is it? And the choices as are, and maybe you can help me add more, the choices are, it is a straightforward B-movie extraterrestrial of some sort that is, God knows for what reason, but coming at us through this. That's one possibility. Uh, it is the Gaian mind in some version of that. In other words, it's the integrated intelligence of the biome of the planet that because probably of the historical crisis is actually noticed us and is trying to twiddle our knobs in some dimension we're not even aware of. So that's it. Guy, extraterrestrial guy in mind uh, could be some strange technological experiment launched from the future. In other words, since these things can communicate with us, since they seem to have some kind of value system related to our problems, maybe they are human beings of some sort. Uh, perhaps it's a time travel project in some distant century that has decided that the key screw-up occurred in the 20th century and they're going back trying to twiddle the knob. <laughs> Notice that these theories have greater and lesser levels of elegance, and I'm not <laughs> advocating any one. Here's one that I think is, is interesting and mildly alarming. Uh, this is the shamanic one, that these uh, are, uh, that this entity, this contact, whatever it is, is somehow coming from the afterworld, that this is a project launched from an ecology of souls, that somehow... Uh, the erasure of the boundary between the living and the dead is what is at stake here. I mean, now this is from, you know, raised as logical positivists. This is the one you would choose last. I think it's much easier to believe in meddling extraterrestrials than that, you know, Uncle Herman and Aunt Fanny are somehow reaching in from the great beyond. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've heard you say before, I'm almost certain I've heard you say before, that at, you can define the, the they, the alien, the creature, whatever, at particular levels of dosage of, um, of hallucinogen, hallucinogenic properties, that at uh, five, precisely five measured grams of psilocybin, so lives, or there lives the pink elephant. You, you, and I've heard you allude to the fact that not only for you is that a consistent dimension, but that for other the people that, that, that you compare notes with at a consistent level, that there are dimensions that are measurable and that the, let's now call it alien, consistently show up. 
Well, yeah, that's basically right. I mean, everybody views it through the filter of their own psychology, but everybody views this room through the filter of their own psychology. And it's not that, I mean, we assume that it's not that different for each of us. Yeah, I mean, what we're talking about here is a phenomenon that contravenes reason, but that fortunately is replicatable. Uh, you know, it's not like, camping in cornfields, waiting for flying saucers. If you camp in the cornfield and take six dried grams, uh, it will find you. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, so finally, we found a causal relationship, uh, which indicates a new level of the dialogue. You see, always the dialogue before was they could fax you in the form of lights in the sky, messiahs, miracles, but you couldn't fax them. Now there is this peculiar zone that has opened up called the psychedelic zone, the psychic zone, the psychological zone. And of course, we're uncertain of the status of what goes on there ontologically. So you're perfectly free to believe it was just a hallucination. Or you're perfectly free to believe, you know, that it was uh, an ambassadorial contact uh, with an alien mind. Yeah. Um, getting back to uh, a couple of things and linking them together, uh, you talk about what are the, the afterworld or the shaman's idea that it comes from a society of souls. And this is one of the possible explanations for what this contact is. And then talking about the soul as the ultimate tool. Uh, another thing that, um, another idea that is goes around in mystical circles is that, and even actually Carl talks about the process to me, is that uh, one of the most important things you can do while we're alive is develop a soul and strengthen a soul, and that this is our tool in the afterlife, and that uh, and and that all this this atmosphere is for is that because we can't actually strengthen our soul on the other side because there's no friction, there's no positive or negative. So this is the place where we can actually develop an internal, inner, shining body that is that is separate from this body, but that this body uses it to create that one. So that's one thing I wanted to put out there. And um, as a possibility, I don't know. Well, this would be probably a good moment to return to the gentleman's question about hypercarbolation. Uh, yeah, I mean, it isn't only castinated, it's a persistent idea worldwide at a certain strata that what life is for is the building and stabilizing and perfecting of, a, of an after-death vehicle of some sort, uh, a light body, huh? Well, uh, hypercarbolation in, in the book I wrote called True Hallucinations, my brother proposed to uh, essentially treat all this metaphysical baffle garb as actually engineering, uh, you know, the, the material for an engineering project. And he set out to uh, emanatize the soul to actually force it to physically appear in nearby physical space as a kind of little spinning disc-shaped object which would follow you around. It would sort of be like a halo. Uh, we would enter into a world where there were two kinds of people, those who had gotten their after-death vehicle outside their body and into visible form, and those who were still working on it. And he, the idea being that this is a union of spirit and matter through the intercession of higher dimensional space. I mean, there's a lot of intellectual and linguistic side of hand here. Nobody knows what he's talking about. The problem is that out of such theorizing came tangible consequences. And I still think that really what, we're, what we need to do now is become actually conscious of the possibility of a techno of a technological, I guess that's the word for it, undertaking to uh, give birth to the collective soul of the species. I mean, the flying saucer, which Jung, the, 
made this very clear. The flying saucer, which haunts our collective imagination, is a totality symbol that is in the unconscious, but it is moving toward conscious appearance and its peculiar mercurial interfacing with the observer indicates that it is something on the borderline between the conscious and the unconscious mind. But that's a temporal, um, mm, a temporary situation. And conceivably, this thing is moving toward us and it, it vibrates with the alien, but it is in fact ourselves. And there is a kind of recurso here where the thing we lost at the descent from Eden is, is actually, you know, on a collision course, coming back again. This is the idea of the archaic revival, that, that we can really deconstruct reality in a fairly radical way. This is not my idea, by the way. I mean, this is what alchemy turned into. And in the 16th century, people like Gerhard Dorn and Robert Flood and John Dee and Michael Sendivorgius and all of these people were on the trail of what they called the lapis or the philosopher's stone. And it was a place where the normal either or algebra of reality gave way to some kind of Boolean both and exception. And strangely enough, that strategy of mixed algebras now characterizes how quantum physics describes uh, the base energy field of existence. Paradox cannot be eliminated from your model without sinking the model because it becomes trivial. Yeah. Um, we're kind of talking about the, um, the end of history Case on the and the thing that occurs to me that the uh, this point that you're talking about, like the dwell point, uh, could be like the birth of a new kingdom of of light. Like you've so got plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and fungi is kind of thought of as a separate kingdom. But software is it potentially a new kingdom of of light that's really coming. It's coming out of the animal. It's like going to be an expression of um, human creativity and imagination. So that could be either part of that whole transition part, or, or maybe the thing that makes it really kind of sort of blows people's minds apart when they realize that, that we've like brought, we've birthed this new life force. Well, yes. I mean, we we. It's it's not clear that it will be overt and manageable, and that there it will be in the laboratory. It's that it's happening all around us. It's that we are we are embedding ourselves in a matrix of silicon and glass. We are actually in the same way that free swimming eukaryotic bacteria turned themselves into mitochondria and powered the cell by embedding themselves in primitive gels. We are beginning to embed ourselves into a, a cultural membrane of some sort. And, and we are essentially the genetically driven components of an organometallic, self-perpetuating matrix that is, uh, on the epigenetic level, redesigning itself all the time. It was McLuhan who said, Human beings have become the genitals of machines. We exist only to improve next year's model. And, and that is a kind of evolution, you see. I mean, the machines, uh, read, they don't change their physical form every million years. They change their physical form every 18 months because human engineers are doing this. Nine million computers a month are being uh, linked into the global network. There's one theory of brain function that says that the higher order functions of the brain are simply emergent properties that come out of a network that has 9 billion plus switching uh, potentials in it. While our global network is quickly approaching this critical number. So what is happening is a globalizing of intelligence. 
new as this sounds, you know, these kinds of ideas have been around for a while. If you haven't read Teilhard de Chardin, who, you know, my God, S.J., right? And he talks about an omega point and what he calls the noosphere, the atmosphere of, of electronic mind that is emerging as a shell in closing planet. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sort of backtracking from your list of possible explanations. Uh-huh, fine. Um, and this one doesn't... I'd like to hear your feedback. I'm going to really sit real well with me and sort of cynical, a little bit materialist, but I mean, um, who's to say that the psychedelic experience are, is not just really a, a, a brain experience, a experience that really is not transcendent, but yet we are so used to a, a very limited way in which we experience re reality in such a small section of our brain, supposedly, that it just seems so outwardly foreign that we externalize. I mean, no, it could... Mind, it, to add to the list, then what do you say to that? Well, what I think the, the major evidence against that view uh, is the amount of the sheer complexity and amount of information seems to be in there. Uh, if evolution works with some kind of economy and that species that work without economy are eliminated, then what in the world would have been... I, I've had very puzzling experiences, maybe some of you have as well, around the theme of memory and psychedelics. I remember once in the Amazon, I, I had had a wonderful mushroom trip and I took it again the next night to try and re reach the same place again. And instead I had this very bizarre trip in which I recalled with perfect clarity the basement of my aunt's house some 20 years before, and I saw myself playing alone in the basement on a certain sunny summer afternoon with uh, a little circus set that I had. And as I played with this circus set, DMT stuff began leaking out of the air in front of me. And here I was 20 years later seeing this as though I were reliving a memory of a five-year-old child say, seeing the stuff that he couldn't tell his parents about, couldn't tell anybody about. So, you know, is that a hallucination? Is that a memory? What is it? It's interesting in talking all the talk we've done about hallucinations to introduce the concept of a cognitive hallucination. A cognitive hallucination is where you don't see something that isn't ordinarily there. You understand something that isn't ordinarily there. An example of this is I had a friend in San Francisco who I had told him, you know, when you take the mushrooms, stay in your apartment in the dark. Just be with them. I told him this maybe 10 times. So he takes the mushrooms an hour into it, he realizes uh, in such a way that just causes him to laugh aloud that I had been kidding, <laughs> that that wasn't what I had meant at all, <laughs> that what I had really meant was to do that because we were preparing a surprise birthday party for him at the bar <laughs> down the street. <laughs> so congratulating himself over the fact that he's figured out this cleverness that we've launched upon him. He dresses himself and gets ready, goes down to this bar and bursts in the front door and says, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> the story goes from there, but that's the part about cognitive hallucinations. In the evolutionary raison d'etre, of preserving this visionary function for 500 million years of evolution until you reach the human species. It, it seems to lack functional and engineering integrity as an approach. Uh, the people, the reductionists who want to say, you know, that these drugs just perturb the brain, I don't think have taken enough of these things. It is not a 
It is not a, a mishmash that you get. What you get is order, often a more ordered and symmetrical and, uh, and self-satisfying world than the one we're living in. Uh, and and in, in as far as the, the mystical and metaphysical people are concerned, they're always saying there's no difference between the inside and the outside until you suggest they take psychedelic drugs. Then they start raving about the, necess- the necessary purity that has to be maintained uh, and how there must be no artificial means. Well, which is it? That there's no inside and no outside, or that these anxiety riddled boundaries have to be maintained at all costs? The problem is, you know, meaning and the meaning of meaning. Wasn't it F.H. Bradley who wrote a book of that title, I think? Uh, uh, what is meaning, and then what does it mean that there is meaning? Is it simply, as Whitehead suggests, the apperception of pattern as such? Or is there uh, eventually some kind of a, of a metaphysic, some kind of a, a discernible pa- uh, mega pattern in all of this? My thing is basically to raise questions and to destroy cultural, culturally contrived answers, because I think they're all horseshit. Uh, it, ha- it hasn't worked. We do not know where we are in the game. We do not, we're not able to recognize the players. Uh, we've forgotten what our waitress looks like. And the <laughs> whole thing is just we're way at sea in this situation. And, uh, and, and what culture seems to do is some kind of strategy for calming everybody down cooking up some parcel of lies, which then everybody works with that and doesn't notice the peculiarity of it all. This is why I think psychedelics are so controversial, because they break down cultural explanations, whatever they are. And I found even with rainforest shamans that uh, they, they are very aware of how far they want to go and and you know it's a rare personality that enjoys kicking all the supports out and just see watching it all collapse into the big who knows but it's very edifying because it's honest i think isn't that a homological threat to folks who uh, have a vested interest in maintaining things well, but what's happening, you see, is who has a vested interest in maintaining these illusions? People who want to die? Is that it? The, it at one point, defense of the status quo made sense. Now, the, the straightest people in the world are beginning to quake in their boots. And the people who, quote unquote, run the world, they've got better information than you and I. And it, they they have they leave their offices white faced at night because they see you know that capitalism is finished because capitalism depends on an endlessly exploitable resource base to function they have no idea what you put in place of a of a of a market driven capitalist economy the population thing is under control it is out of control To get it under control, you would have to take on uh, the people who've run Western civilization for 1,700 years, i.e. the Roman Catholic Church. Who wants to dig into that mess? The ozone depletion of the atmosphere may have already passed criticality. That, That may be a death sentence waiting to be served, and so forth and so on. So I don't think there is, uh, anybody I, I think what we're seeing is spreading panic in the control centers of Western civilization, and that very soon you can have a real discussion. Essentially, the Clinton thing is a is just a gesture in that direction. But eventually, we're going to have to have a discussion about you know who gets to go to the lifeboats and who doesn't, and stuff like that. And it's all going to be very dicey, I think. Oh. 
Do you want to talk a little bit about how society then would be informed by psychedelics and, and what, what direction it might take, and how our present society could utilize this in a way um, that would be productive and not just uh, the perpetuation of this whole sort of you know, Nancy Reagan, Snape's philosophy, just saying no type of thing? Well, our, our problem is that we are in denial of our circumstance. If we could actually feel the situation, everybody would immediately walk to the parking lot, get in their car, and go out and slave to stop the agony. But we don't feel it. I mean, we see the pictures from Bosnia. We see the pictures from Somalia. We feel it to some degree. We send money. But we don't stop consuming furiously. We don't reconstruct our lives. Taking psychedelics, I think, because its primary function is to dissolve boundaries, it dissolves the boundary between you and the pain or the problem, and then you have to do something about it. Who who would be proposed in this society is going to distribute this stuff? I mean, I, I like that. I like to see that happen. I really would. But is it going to be psychiatrists, psychologists, is it going to be the church? I mean, or is it just going to be you know a viable account? I, I I see that as a problem. I'd like to see what you're proposing. Well, I think it should be self-organized. The way to do it is to make it legal. You know. You, the spores are legal. They contain no psilocybin. There should be something called the Vegetable Drug Act, which simply states no plant is illegal. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Just that's it. And, uh, and it would all sort itself out. And the, and the junkie could have his little opium garden and... I don't know if cokeheads could get it together enough to fill their backyard with coke. It would all sort out very, very nicely. And it's preposterous. I mean, you know, you read that in the Middle Ages, that in 1432 in Amsterdam, a pig was hung for murder. And then you, well, that's the kind of thing we've got going with the concept of an illegal plan. I mean, from any future enlightened point of view, they would just look back at that and say, how quaint, <laughs> you know, what a bizarre notion of reality. Yeah. I'd like to talk about how the legalization of these substances um, is not of a cultural context. And, and then you think about, about legalization and then you think about um, Making it really okay in my mind to buy the law, if it buy his morality, and that I don't, I don't know, like it, it, it's possible for it to be legal. I really, without a, without a, uh, without a battle, or without a major uh, shift in the way things work, it, it seems like it's something that I need to take upon myself. Well, I think the the whole higher law. The hope comes from Europe. I think America will just be shamed into legalization because in Europe, it, it, you know, the drug laws are very loose. And Europe is a truly secular society. I mean, they just don't have rattlesnake handling, Christers and Branch Davidians and all. They cannot figure this stuff out. You know? <laughs> I mean, I had a German friend visit me in Hawaii last summer and I I took her to the beach, and she immediately whipped her top off. And then I had to explain that you couldn't do that in America. And she'd said she'd heard you couldn't do that in America, but she couldn't believe that it was actually true. And, I, and then when I was looking at her, thought what it would take to make it possible to take your top off at a public beach in America, you just realize this is a society of lost souls. I mean, this is a society of the screwballs that couldn't handle the secularization of Europe and came here to practice what they called religious freedom, which basically meant crypto-fascism on everybody else, you know. Uh, yeah, I agree. Look, 
uh, uh, black people didn't break loose till they got their backs up. Gay people would have been forever marginalized. They're not handing rights out in this society. <laughs> you you have to take it. And uh, this the drug thing has just been a polite conversation for far too long. I think it's getting a little louder. But all, but uh, weasel arguments are being used. I mean, the reason. Cannabis is moving toward legalization is because an appeal is being made to the darkest impulses of capitalism. You know, you could make so much money off this. What do you care that it's a drug? <laughs> uh, what about the side of the rights bill and that responsibility? I sometimes wonder, you know, as much as you like to complain about law and, and, and structure, it seems like we also rely on that to provide certain social structures around how something would be. We don't often claim the responsibility. How, how do you see, let's say, if um, drugs were legalized, how would we self uh, manage in a responsible way to um, make that occur? Well, I maintain that since alcohol and tobacco are legal, we have already proven that we can absorb the social consequences of legalizing any drug. I mean, if you can tolerate the costs and what alcohol and all that does to insurance, then heroin is going to pose no problem. The, what, the problem with the law is that when the law becomes irrational, the law loses its moral force. And so it has to be reformed. And uh, this is, I believe, very difficult in this drug area because nobody's being straight about what's at issue. The real issue, like let's take cannabis, which is, you know, most people, whether they smoke cannabis or not, have the impression, I think, that this is a generally benign and over-discussed peril. Uh, and yet, I don't... I cannot imagine America legalizing cannabis simply because its psychological consequences are that it erodes loyalty to uh, the work ethic. You know, if people are not interested in screwing widgets on wonkles if they smoke and contrast it uh, to caffeine. Now, caffeine is a dangerous drug, does liver damage, is uh, known to be implicated in a number of pathologies. Uh, and yet, every contract, every labor contract signed in the Western world enshrines the right of laborers twice a day to stop the assembly line and tank up on coffee. <laughs> this is an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary folkway. And why? Because caffeine is a made-to-order drug for the purposes of slave capitalism. I mean, you just scurry right back to your keyboard or your assembly line, and you can do the 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. shift then without, you know, falling on your face like a normal primate would if they weren't jacked up on some alkaloid. And so that's very welcome. Uh, you know, it was McLuhan who made the point, and it still hasn't been assimilated by enough people, that uh, he said uh, that technologies carry a hidden agenda and shape their user in ways that the user is never conscious of. And in the great case that McLuhan made was print, which he said the linear and uniform nature of print created the preconditioned mindset able to accept democracy, the assembly line, the concept of the citizen, a whole bunch of modern ideas are uh, us presuppose print. Well, drugs are technologies, and they shape the users in ways that the users never suspect. And uh, our frenzied, goal-oriented, surface-obsessed society is a society of sugar, alcohol, red meat, and television. You know, I mean, television is an incredibly invasive and powerful drug. 
uh, the average American watches six hours a day. Imagine if following World War II, a drug had been introduced, that now the average American spent six hours a day absolutely loaded on this drug, doing nothing else. Uh, but because we are materialists, we don't see television as a drug. And yet, you know, your blood pools in your rear end, your brain waves fall into a measurable zone. You fixate. There is an entire set of symptoms, no less dramatic than the symptoms of smoking a bomber or honking up a line. So, but we don't see television uh, that way. And the horror of television is you don't even get to have your own trip. You have somebody else's trip <laughs> sponsored by the cosmetically enhanced surfaces of products. I mean, talk about a hell drug. My God. Yeah. <clears throat> You see this little minute portion scattered around, really having an effect which will constantly put a chain reaction before it's too late to uh, to really work some change, or is it more like small colonies when you say uh, Well, see the plan see if it were business as usual, these psychedelic communities might not amount to anything. But I think that the world is going to get so peculiar as the chickens come home to roost that you'll have to take psychedelic drugs to understand what's going on. And that the people who don't will be running around like chickens with their heads cut off because we haven't come you know, people yak about the apocalypse, but this is not the apocalypse. This is the garden party before the apocalypse. I mean, once it really hits, it's going to require a great deal of faith to believe that we're going to make it through it. And, uh, and I think that more and more organizations, governments, governing institutions are going to turn to the fringes for answers, because what our circumstance is, is that history failed, orthodoxy failed, science failed, capitalism failed, reason failed, and we can't keep practicing these things because they failed. The ship is sinking. We can't have a debate about when we'll arrive in Bermuda. We're never going to arrive in Bermuda. The boat is now sinking. So the agenda has to change. And also, these people are dying off. You know, the old control freaks, the people who have one foot in the 19th century. Uh, as to your question of whether or not it will happen fast enough, well, that's the horse race we're involved in. That's the excitement, you know. It'll be a photo finish. H.G. Wells said, history is a race between education and catastrophe. Yeah, and the, and the other thing is Christianity took 300 years to become, you know, and it, and it started off with different sets of people that were nurturing the Christian idea. Unfortunately, we're only Catholic at one, but it could be the same thing. We could start these little sort of copy clashes of peony takers that just... Well, and Christianity was able to do that in a world where information moved at the speed of a horse's gallop. So... You know, there's an enormous psychedelic religion flourishing in Brazil right now that just cannot convert people fast enough. Is missionarizing the United States. Shamanism. Uh, see, I think the reason I called my second book The Archaic Revival is because I think this is the overarching metaphor of the 20th century, that the 19th century was the gentleman's century, the white gentleman, when it all worked, commerce flourished, cities were built, the poor knew their place, the brown people held their position. And the 20th century has been all about confronting the, the bankruptcy of all of that. And from the time of surrealism and, uh, Freud and Jung and Dada, right through to rave music 
and jazz and rock and roll and abstract expressionism. These are all archaic impulses. You know, the, the 19th century is all about realism, materialism, and defined social structures. The 20th century deconstructs the visual image, deconstructs the idea of simple location. We have body piercing. We have uh, uh, trance dancing, fire walking. All of these things are impulses to return to the primitive. And what it means is that in the aura of the realization that history has failed, we're going back to an earlier model. This is what societies do when they get in trouble. You know, we forget because we're the inheritors of it. But when medieval Christianity essentially got a flat tire by having 70 popes in 25 years, none of them died a natural death, that clued people to the idea that there was something wrong with Christian idealism. And the Renaissance capitalists, Italian city-state entrepreneurs invented classicism. Classicism, meaning a, a society based on the ideals of Greece and Rome, was a science fiction option at that point. Greece and Rome had been buried in the ground for 1,500 years, and yet they dug it up. They dug up the buildings. They dug up the manuscripts. They dug it all up, and they said, this is how people should live, and we'll found classicism, and we will be the patrons of the arts, and we will undertake vast architectural undertakings, and so forth and so on. And it worked. It set a model for society, Roman law, Greek aesthetics, clear into the middle of the 19th century, when then the full consequences of the Industrial Reformation uh, created uh, you know, a kind of new circle some sort. Now, uh, we require such a radical re, uh, a new paradigm that we have to reach outside the domain of history entirely. And the archaic then, which is a model of nomadism, of very little material culture, of uh, hedonism, a lot of focus on sexuality, sensuality, body adornment, this sort of thing, um, and an information-based culture ruled by magic. In the case of the archaic, it was natural magic. In our case, it will be the technological magic of electromagnetic uh, technology. You know, a global tribe. McLuhan was right. I mean, McLuhan is given zilch credit. He understood all of this stuff. He said all of this by 1965. The people who dismissed him never understood him. I'm quite convinced. Yeah. The world is even button scores and the mushroom will play in this to a whole atomic network. Well, I think that part of what we're on the brink of is uh, a technological innovation, but I think also a rewiring of the human organism and that. Uh, what psilocybin is about is it's a catalyst for language production and evolution. And that uh, the future evolution of language involves language being shifted into the visual domain. Notice how much, how more visual reality is becoming, how icon driven. Uh, the computer interface is and stuff like this. Uh, I think that psychedelics hold the way toward a kind of telepathy, not a telepathy of you hear my thoughts, but a telepathy of I see what you mean. This would erode boundaries tremendously. I mean, it's astonishing to think that our global civilization is linked together by nothing more than small mouth noises and the electronic transduction of saying. I mean, small mouth noises are a very, very crude way to communicate the kind of complexity that our, our scene requires. 
the great thing about psychedelics is whether these personalities are realized or or less than realized is that you don't need them. You know, the realized ones can be your friends. But the great thing about the psychedelic enterprise is that it's democratic and self-directed. And uh, uh, actually, my experience is that if you really take high doses, it's hard to be a rat. You have to have Im incredible defenses to be a real rat and take real high doses. And what it means is sooner or later it will ambush you in some tremendously unpleasant way, and then you will get straight. Uh, I think it's tremendously exciting because it's a chance to take control of one of the project of one of defining one's own authenticity. And I don't really the the idea of the guide it, or I'm glad that that concept has given way to the idea of the sitter because the sitter gets it much better. What the sitter is there to do is to keep you from rolling off the bed and to tell you that it's going to be all right, even though the sitter may have lost all confidence that it will ever <laughs> be all right. And they are guiding you nowhere because they haven't the faintest idea where you are. You know, they're just there to reassure. Uh, guided trips uh, are as often ambiguous, I think, uh, as... Uh, as positive. So did he, you know, I know a guy who takes mushrooms fairly often, and he always says to me, he says, each time I take it, my goal is to stand more. And what he means is that there's no bottom to it, and it will reveal literally as much as you can tolerate. And, the, you know, you can get into a lock with it where you say, Show me what you really are. Show me what you really are for yourself. And instantly, the cheerful scenarios of machine elves dancing mice and little candies spinning against black backgrounds, that's like suspended. And there's this organ tone, like from the Bach B minor mass, and these black velvet curtains begin to lift. And after about 15 seconds of that, you say, that's enough, thank you, of what you really are for yourself. Because you realize it is, it, it is willing to comply with the request, but your mind can't handle it. It is coming at you through a series of veils. It is trying to be reassuring. I mean, you're saying, my God, it's an alien from the heart of the galaxy. And what it's trying to pass as is your next door neighbor. Uh, because if it were ever to reveal the true dimensions of its alienness, you would probably vaporize in the presence of such peculiarity. Death by astonishment. We want to, <laughs> we want to avoid that at all costs. Uh, yeah. Stories abound. I mean, stories upon stories, amazing stories. And, I, and once you collect enough of them, in, you, you start collecting them thinking that there's going to be a pattern where you will learn something. Eventually, you realize these stories are just designed to befuddle and lead you astray. I mean, you cannot tell what is going on. Uh, yeah, I've considered it uh, great trip stories. Uh, Trading with the Aliens. Some of you may know a wonderful little story by Clifford Simak. I was talking to somebody about this recently. It was about a man who goes to a garage sale and he buys an oak roll top desk and in and he gets it home and he discovers that in one he just notices actually that in one corner of this desk there's what looks like an ivory dot, an inlay of ivory. And he then uh has this desk, and uh, after a couple of months, he he finds this thing on this dot, which he doesn't know what it is. It's just some little thing he doesn't can't figure it out, and uh, he discovers 
to make a long story short, that if he will put something on this dock, it will be traded. And so he puts a paper clip and he gets a something or other. And then he puts a dime and he gets something else every 24 hours. And he begins trading through this alien trader. Uh, they, they, they are meme traders, these creatures from hyperspace. And the trick is to trade, is to get them to trade something that's very useful to you and valueless to them. Uh, I grew up in western Colorado and up above nine or 10,000 feet in the old mining camps, uh, there are what are called pack rats. And, and what, a, what pack rats are about is they steal stuff. They steal little things, but they always leave something. They are trader rats. They don't actually steal. And there are many stories about people getting in league with a pack rat and trading seven up bottle caps for gold nuggets that were hidden in the walls that because of these old mining towns, these rats have been stealing from the bar tills of a century ago. And, uh, and so this is a, you know, and the strange thing is when you trade with a pack rat, you have to discern its psychology. Because it may trade seven up bottle caps for gold nuggets, but if you switch to dimes, it will switch to dead bees and they're no good to you. So you, you, you have to keep negotiating, you see, to get the good and to, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Exactly. Although somebody pointed out to me, it was another one of these torpedoes, unexpected, that that print is visible language, that print is the condensation of sound. It's just that it requires a medium. Yeah. I was wondering, in view of what you pointed out about some of the liabilities of our asking the question of what is the darkest self, which Bill is being, and I'm wondering if you could share some of your thoughts about setting an agenda for a trip and entering into a dialogue with this alien, as opposed to perhaps being more passive and just allowing this emergence without any conscious direction, to the extent that that's possible. I tend to be very passive. I sense immense power and potential in these states, and I'm frankly afraid of it. I mean, I like to watch. That's my bit. And I have no desire to seize the levers and start pulling and pushing buttons. I had a bit of a few. When I was younger, we messed around in more radical ways and had experiences that really I felt like threatened our sanity because you just couldn't believe what was going on. Uh, I don't set agendas. Some people do that. Uh, what I do do is I talk to it and I, I ask it to, to show itself. And I do think you have to, you, you have to approach the thing. It, it is shy or it's tasteful. It's hard to figure out which, but in any case, it will not speak to you unless spoken to. You can go through an eight-hour trip, and it will never say a word because you never said a word. And you have to say to it, show yourself. It doesn't hurt to verbalize it. I mean, I think of it in my mind. I sort of, I, I, I invoke it, but it's also somewhat like a seduction. I mean, you say, come out, show yourself, be beautiful. And then this thing, literally almost like a turmoil in the air, and they condense, and they then they do show themselves. Uh, but unless invited, they won't do that. Now, in DMT, that isn't true. They're uninvited. I mean, you're in their domain. You're in Elf Land Grand Central Station, and everybody's trying to get on the train to Westport, and you're just there, you know, in the middle of this crazy situation. Yeah. yeah. 
I don't know. I think that's really a hard thing to say. I mean, I know people who say DMT is their favorite drug, and the last time they took it was 67. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're not talking abuse here. Uh, I think mo psilocybin three or four times a year is definitely means that you are a psychedelic person, for sure. It definitely means that your every waking moment is informed and transformed by your relationship to this stuff. It doesn't take very much because it's a, it's a way of thinking, you know. Uh, I admire people who can do it a lot and not go off the deep end because what I find is, you know, Basically, what we talk about in these workshops is what I would call the generic psychedelic experience. You know, it lasts four to eight hours. There are all kinds of crazy hallucinations, insights, tears, laughter, self-affirmation. Then it goes away. That's the generic psychedelic trip. But if you start pushing, then you get to be Columbus. You know, if you, for instance, take psilocybin every 72 hours for 10 days, you will cure in the marketplace. You will preach to the masses. Uh, you will become so convinced of dogmas and points of view so peculiar that it will hand your friends a crisis. I mean, I've been there. And so it's the trick is to understand when you need to chill uh, because uh, it just starts opening ahead of you. Like when we would take it in the Amazon, uh, one of the things that we noted and talked about and was actually a moment of concern was in every psilocybin trip in the Amazon, there would come this, this moment where, where you would realize that the jungle was friendly and that that's where you belong. And there was this impulse to just take your clothes off and walk into it. And with perfect confidence, I could survive. It would take care of me. It is not threatening. It is not unfriendly. It loves me. I don't know whether that's true. I don't know what would happen to you when you came down. I mean, there are stories of people not on psilocybin who walked into the jungle and, you know, were mad from fly bites 12 hours later and basically had to be shot like dogs in the best Colombian fashion. Uh, so, you know, this is, an, so this is a very intense perception that you just don't know what to make of. Is it true? Could one somehow sustained by psychedelics walk into that and survive or, or not? Yeah. These people, I think, could do that without psychedelics. Like some of these people that are asking me how to do skills trips, they could definitely do. You mean white people? Who have, but they've trained themselves. They've hardened their bodies, and they've learned how to make fire and how to get water from plants. And to do it just on the spur of the moment, I don't know how long you'd last out there. Yeah, sure. Would you say something to compare LSD and mushrooms? Well, psilocybin is much more visual. Uh, LSD is more psychoanalytical, therapeutic, personal in some way. Uh, it may be more uh, efficient at personality work, you know, reconstruction and overcoming trauma or phobia or something like that. Psilocybin is largely visual and uh, spectacularly so. That's what distinguishes the tryptamine hallucinogens is the ease with which they elicit really beautiful and complex hallucinations. I mean, people, uh, straight scientists who write about what they call hallucination are really writing about what is technically called hypnagogia which means the trivial hallucinations on the edge of sleep, you know, the spinning wheels, the moving grids of color, the dancing mice, that sort of thing. Uh, psychedelic hallucinations are visionary operas of some sort. I mean, they are tremendous. 
they're more visually dramatic than any film experience or experience in the real world that you could have. There's no very good explanation for what that's all about. In your trial and error in your five grams of mushroom, um, did you, uh, have you, have you got 10 grams and that's too much, or, is it, or have you built up to that and that's, that's enough? 10 grams is too much for me. I mean, I, people have different reactions to it. I think if it gets un, too, uh, if the episodes of un-English ability are too prolonged, then you need to back the dose down, you know, because it just doesn't make any sense. It's also the power of it. I mean, my God, when you overdose on psilocybin, it's like an asteroid struck the planet or something. It's very hard to convince yourself that it's confined between your ears. It's more like, you know, everything from Las Vegas West just was vaporized. Uh, <laughs> I think we were talking about visual, the visual field. The dream state is like a vision, except that it's not emotionally charged in quite the same way that vision is. It's almost a difference in emotional quality rather than the visual impression. Uh, I mean, do you agree? Does that? I think so. When I'm dreaming, though, I, I get more of the feeling of, of a of a um, sorry, very emotional time but when i'm in vision it's more like rapture um which i guess is high emotion but that's what i my analysis of it is that it's touching you at a deeper emotional level but it's interesting this question you raise about dreams we were talking last week it's fairly common among people who use psychedelics to have dreams in which the the psychedelic actually appears as a motif and then you take it and then you have the experience in the dream. And I've even had this with DMT, which is to my mind, the strongest psychedelic. So it's very interesting because it's almost, it's a perfect case proving that really you can do it all yourself. In other words, that the chemical precondition is there in deep sleep. Yeah, Eric. Uh, do you think memory is um, more or less instead of memory being something you remember uh, in the sense of uh, <clears throat> replaying something, but it actually takes you back to the moment or something? That, so you mean that it could be an extremely strong memory of a psychedelic state? That's a possibility. I, it's pretty interesting. I don't know. I, I've had very puzzling experiences, maybe some of you have as well, around the theme of memory and psychedelics. I remember once in the Amazon, I, I had had a wonderful mushroom trip and I took it again the next night to try and re reach the same place again. And instead, I had this very bizarre trip in which I recalled with perfect clarity the basement of my aunt's house some 20 years before and I saw myself playing alone in the basement on a certain sunny summer afternoon with uh, a little circus set that I had and as I played with this circus set DMT stuff began leaking out of the air in front of me and here I was 20 years later seeing this as though I were reliving a memory of a five-year-old child say, seeing the stuff that he couldn't tell his parents about, couldn't tell anybody about. So, you know, is that a hallucination? Is that a memory? What is it? It's interesting in talking all the talk we've done about hallucinations to introduce the concept of a cognitive hallucination. A cognitive hallucination is where you don't see something that isn't ordinarily there. You understand something that isn't ordinarily there. An example of this is I had a friend in San Francisco who I had told him, you know, when you take the mushrooms, stay in your apartment in the dark. Just be with them. I told him this maybe 10 times. So he takes the mushrooms 
an hour into it, he realizes uh, in such a way that just causes him to laugh aloud that I had been kidding. But that wasn't what I had meant at all. That what I had really meant was to do that because we were preparing a surprise birthday party for him at the bar down the street. So congratulating himself over the fact that he's figured out this cleverness that we've launched upon him. He dresses himself and gets ready, goes down to this bar and bursts in the front door and says, I'm here. (laughs) The story goes from there, but that's the part about cognitive hallucinations. Uh, And of course, sometimes a cognitive hallucination will stand up. Then it becomes a new truth and uh, passes into the meme wars as a competing uh, member. What else is on people's minds here? Just I'm not curious about the, about the phenomena of the when you're on the mushrooms and your experience is like other entity or other intelligence. Yeah. And I, I've like tried dialoguing with this thing. I'm like, asking, are you a hallucination? Are you real? What are you? And it's like, I, mm-hmm. I just can't tell. I just cannot tell whether it's real or whether I'm hallucinating it or whether I'm creating it or whether it's another part of me that's separated from me or it's a, it's a cluster of neurons that's disassociated from the rest of my brain or something. It's just like the most, the most puzzling thing to me. Any insight you can give into the experience. Well, I think that's the core puzzling experience when you meet the other organized as a speaking mind. And uh, I've wondered these same things, asked it what it is. It seems to be able to present itself many different ways. I mean, it can be almost like a robotic, cybernetic, disembodied kind of thing. Or sometimes it's like, you know, your girlfriend in hyperspace. It has this very sexy kind of, uh, I don't know, these funny vibes to be coming off a pharmaceutical product. Uh, <laughs> and, but it might as well be another intellect because it seems like it. It seems as different from you as the person sitting next to you, at least that different from you. So I treat it that way. I don't know, you know, perhaps people have always heard voices in states of high uh, agitation or stimulation. We don't know what to do with that kind of thing because it's not in our tradition, but it's a shocking reality. I mean, for anybody who thinks plants don't talk, it's a real life reorienting experience to have one then harangue you. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I didn't think plants talked. I didn't. I had friends who claimed this, and I, my dream was really to reach to figure out what these people could possibly mean. That I actually hear them talking because I don't hear voices. It's more like images, feelings, sensations. Well, it has many modalities. It can be a like with ayahuasca. It seems to be truly a visual communicator. Its mode is vision. It shows you what it intends. But the mushroom actually speaks. It delivers itself of little aphorisms. Uh, You know, I'm sure you've heard me try to sum them up for people. I mean, it's said things to me like, uh, man must have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you'll become part of somebody else's plan. It's said... um, Nature loves courage. The way nature responds to courage is by removing obstacles. Well, these are things that your middle track Zen guru could probably come up with. But then it says other things which are completely puzzling. It says things like, uh, what you call man is time. And then sometimes it, it, you know, it is humorous. I mean, hilariously, insanely humorous. It's like having Groucho Marx in bed with you. I mean, so sometimes it, it has a certain 
Rod Steiger-esque kind of uh, Jewish persona. I remember one conversation I had with it where I was said, what are you doing here? And it said, listen, you're a mushroom, you live cheap. <laughs> and I said, oh, what? No. Can I go back to my audiences and report that this is what the extraterrestrial said? You're a mushroom, you live cheap. It said, you know, the neighborhood wasn't so bad till the monkeys moved in. Uh, I'll tell a funny story about this thing, about the, the Jewish persona of the mushroom. Because I was, it's a standard story of mine that I tell. And I was in a restaurant in Malibu uh, with Bob Chartoff and Lou Carlino, who some of you know, a bunch of fancy Hollywood type people. And there was this French uh, producer there, this woman, and she and I had been seated together at dinner. And she said, you say that the mushroom speaks to you, but I don't understand how this can be. What do you mean it speaks to you? And, I, in, and Ralph Abraham was there too. And I, in my sincere way, said, well, it's like the part Steiger played in The Pawnbroker. It just, and at that moment, Steiger stops by the table to shake hands with everybody there. And I'm like, <laughs> and <clears throat> true story, true story. And Ralph, who's watched this whole thing go down, leans across the room, leans across the table to me and says, what this proves is the mushroom can reach into our world no matter where we are and shake the bars. <laughs> Which isn't a very good answer to your question. The answer is, I don't know. It's a puzzle. It's very strange. It's very, very mysterious. I guess I should try and describe this. You are the people to tell, if anybody is. What I found about this communicating with it thing is that um, sometimes it's easy and it just comes. And that's what the trip is about. But if it's elusive for you, or if you've taken mushrooms many times, and yet this doesn't seem to be what happened to you, I couldn't describe how it works for me anyway. It's as though a certain level of intoxication with the mushroom is the precondition for being able to communicate, but is not itself enough. So that I will be, I will feel the levels building in my body and I will be very stoned. And then I will come into this place where I will say, now it is possible to invoke the spirit in the mushroom. And then I invoke it. And uh, it, it's a pretty straightforward thing. I remember an old I Love Lucy thing where Ethel is asking Lucy how she gets in touch with the flying saucers. And she says, I just say, come in, little green man, come in, little green man. <laughs> it's almost like that. In fact, it is like that. <laughs> no, they're not green. What I do is I get the feeling, which is, I call it, um, it's almost like... I'm embarrassed to even tell this kind of stuff. It, it, it's a feeling of being very Irish. It's a feeling of elfin-ness. And then I say, aha, we're getting close in. They're ne I smell them. They're nearby. And then I just say, you know, show, show, show. And there's this music, this tinkling stuff. And it begins to get stronger. So I say, you know, come in, little green man, come in. And then it, it gets louder and louder. And then finally, once you get the valve open, you don't have to worry. It will pour through as long as you can watch it and be with it and sing with it. And it is obviously the basis for the idea of elves and elfin energy and little people who make jeweled machines and play musical instruments and live in the mountains. Yes. Did you, uh, do you know how in the very first instance that you began to, you must have learned in some way how to invoke 
but to say, come in, come in, come in. And it's some, something you've stumbled into it some way. And I, can you recount that incident? Do you remember that? Sure. The way it happened to me was uh, someone in 1967, just a few months after I'd begun taking LSD, somebody brought DMT to me and said, without any introduction, they just said, here's something you might be interested in. It's a drug. And I said, how long does it last? And they said, five minutes. I said, okay. <laughs> Thinking, five minutes, what can it be, you know? And what happens with, with DMT is you leap over all the barriers in the first few seconds Unlike mushrooms, where over hours and hours on a high dose, you might navigate yourself to the center of the mandala, DMT is like being struck by metaphysical lightning. I mean, the main question is, what the hell happened? Because it immediately took me to this place I had never suspected existed, you know, this dome-like brilliantly lit space where these self-transforming machine organic things were all around me and leaping through my body and singing and making objects and showing all this stuff to me. And it was like just all the veils were torn away in a single moment. And then that inspired me to look at the chemistry and then the botany and the shamanism, and to try and make my way back to that place at not quite such a super voltage. And that was the raison d'etre for going to the Amazon, because those drugs in the Amazon, those plant combinations are working off the same chemicals. It was the reason for being into the mushrooms, because the mushroom really experientially and chemically it's fair it's quite reasonable to call it a slow release dmt trip dmt is quite an astonishing thing i don't understand how they manage to keep it secret because it's the convincer you know it's for the person who thinks these things only work if you're soft-headed because it's just it raises all the questions in a hurry it's so intense and so oriented toward the other and the visual and the hallucinogenic that it isn't really like a drug. It's more like an event that you ran into. You just came around a corner and there was the unspeakable. I don't know if I would have ever, uh, I was lucky in that sense. A lot of people take psychedelics a lot, I think, and never quite realize just what it is that they have their hands on because you need these ego-threatening, if not life-threatening experiences somewhere along the way to hip you to just how intense uh, this can be. There's nothing any more intense this side of the grave than a strong psychedelic experience. Did you begin then to, once you've done the DMT, did you begin then to, as you work, work with the psilocybin or the mushrooms, did you begin to... And since it's slower, you would you began to have some kind of recognition that you needed to invoke more and more, and you began to did it take a ritual form, for example? Well, what, you do the same thing each time. What seemed most astonishing to me in these early DMT trips was that there was language that I hadn't expected. That what's going on in the DMT trip, besides the body transformations and the visual hallucinations and the little alien entities, is they are speaking to you and you are understanding and yet they're speaking in a language which is visible, which is, it's pure magic. It's pure linguistic intent, which you behold with your eyes and you feel like Moses before the burning bush or something. You just say, my God, I didn't know humans were wired for this kind of a thing. What is it? And then for many years, I smoked DMT and contemplated it. And on DMT, it comes very, very fast. It's like spun gold and mercury, you know, and supremely intricate and supremely worked and rapid. And my dream was to be able to slow it down, to be able to do it, to be able to show it to people. And I read Robert Graves, The White Goddess, 
and had the notion in there. You know, he talks about a, pri a uh, primary poetic language that he thinks existed before history that was so from the bone and the flesh of people that anyone could understand it. It wasn't like Japanese and Iranian and American English. It was from the bones, not from the place. And poetry made in this language had the power not only to move people's hearts and to open their souls, but to actually cause them to see realities pass before their eyes. And that these poets were using sound and language to do something that we have only the faintest, faintest memory of. And what the DMT beings seemed to be saying was, this art can be brought back. This visible language, this poetry made manifest is what you should learn to do. And all the trips were about, see what we're doing? Do this, do this. And, and eventually, I was able to do it on psilocybin. And then it, it was apparent to me that it's gibberish. <laughs> and uh, that I had uh, somehow missed the mark or that you have to be stoned, or that there are piece, parts still to be learned. This is a very persistent theme in these deep psychedelic things, I think, is something is trying to be communicated that is not on the love one another level, but more like fold flap A to flap B, that kind of thing. There is concern to communicate the construction of something. And when I realized this and then looked back through mythology, it's always been there. The Mandaeans, who were a Gnostic cult uh, of the even the pre-Christian period, had the notion that when the Messiah for them came, he would construct a machine of some sort. They call it this, that he would construct a machine and that the machine would then pump all the souls to the moon and then from there they would be taken care of in some way. But it was the, miss, the missing link was a machine which the second Adam would come and build. Cat had this experience of the structure of the flying saucer when we were in the Amazon in 71. It was all about how do you build a transdimensional vehicle with the help of elfin advice? And it was molecular. It was interiorized. It had something to do with sound. You sing it into existence, but it has something to do with DNA. It's a technology that is fantasy for us, except that you can feel that this has always been the Pythagorean faith, that color, sound, angle of attack, all of these things could go together to produce uh, a super technology and a vehicle. And in the deep psychedelic states, there always seems to be uh, either the concern with building something, imparting information about a plan, or the other persistent motif that people have is uh, that the world is going to win and that there will be intervention of some spectacular sort, the second coming, flying saucers, something like that. Now, why these motifs exist, I don't know. I've talked at times about what I call the transcendental object at the end of time. And I think maybe what human history is, is a kind of collective psychedelic trip where we are closing in on the mystery at the center of the mandala, sort of the shamanic gift difficult to obtain. And what it is, of course, is it's the human soul realized, realized. And I almost said realized as a technology, but the realizing of it in any form would realize it as a technology. So that really history is the siren song of the soul, the saucer song of the soul, the group mind coming into existence through our efforts over several thousand years, something first glimpsed in dreams 
and then glimpsed in, you know, higher mythologies and then glimpsed in technological visions and in psychedelic states and finally actually invoked into history in such a way that its reality is incontrovertible, then history ends. I don't understand why anyone could be moved to say such crazy things, but uh, it seems to be the content of, uh, of the experience. Now, of course, if any of you are psychologists, you recognize this as a syndrome, uh, grandiose delusions, messiah complex, uh, misplaced reference. It has different kinds of names. It means you think that you're going to be present or a part of the most important thing that ever happened. It's a serious form of mental illness, uh, <laughs> unless it's true. <laughs> and you don't find out uh, until it's too late. So, Yes. Once the psychoactivity was discovered, the real visionary potential of the mushroom, I think it would be connected to the cow. It would be viewed as a product of the cow in the same way that the manure, the hide, the milk, the blood, and the flesh was. And it's significant that in the Middle East, at the very earliest stratum of culture that is anything other than the chipping of flint, there are images of cattle. Cattle everywhere, cattle at Altamira, cattle at Lascaux, painted very, very sensitively. What, what the ancient cave art of North Africa and Southern Europe is, is a celebration of women and cattle. Men appear as stick figures wielding spears. Women are drawn as uh, filled in curvilinear structures their fecundity, their pregnancy, in many cases, their physical beauty. I don't know how many of you know the paintings of the Tasselli frescoes in Algeria, but there are paintings of seated women that are as good as anything Monet or Gauguin did. I mean, where it, it's feeling, you know, it's the curve of the hip and the incurve of the back and the swell of the belly under the breast. I mean, this is... Uh, it's figure, figurative drawing as good as we do today. So women and cattle at the very earliest uh, stratum of consciousness are mixed together. We always talk about this early level of culture as hunting, gathering. And I think that we drop our voices. We say it's a hunting, gathering culture. <laughs> If you've spent time in the Amazon, you know that what this means is once a month or once every six weeks, the men get their acts sufficiently together and they make up enough coca that they all go get their bows and arrows and they go off for a hunt and leave the women and the children behind and get all coked up and uh, hunt and party all night. And then when the coca is all gone, because usually women make the coca, when the coca is all gone, whatever they've captured on the hunt, they triumphantly carry back to the village. And often, you know, it's garbage. And the women will be waiting at the village for them to come back and say, you know, eight days in the woods and you bring back one maggoty agouti. You know, what kind of clowns are you people? <laughs> but this is the hunt, you know, and the hunter is the hero and they'll tell the story around the campfire. Meanwhile, what is really going on, as is always the case, is that women are gathering and gathering is a highly conscious activity where, you know, this plant is OK, that plant is bad. The root of this plant is poisonous, but if pound with, pounded with water and washed, becomes edible. It's, in, it's, an it's an activity that demands discrimination, intelligence, a body of lore, memory, uh, powers of observation, so forth and so on. It is, in fact, uh, serious business. While this hunting thing exists almost to keep the men out of the women's hair. So 
you can imagine that the visual acuity thing had as great an impact on the gathering as it did on the hunting. Because in many plants, it's very hard to tell the poison from the non-poison. And, and also, you gain, there are forms of visual acuity that are so removed from our awareness that we don't even recall them, such as being able to track an animal or being able to tell where animals have been or being able to tell just by the color of a landscape where the water is flowing under the ground and therefore where certain kinds of plants will occur. All of these cognitive activities, these integrative activities that rely on observation and memory, were tremendously aided by the presence of an imagination-enhancing enzyme in the food chain. And the goddess religions of the ancient Middle East are nothing more than... Uh, the tail end of this. It had went on for 15,000 years and then it began to fade out about 5,000 years ago. The imagination, the living in the imagination conference we just had, we were very, very fortunate to have Rian Eisler come in and talk to us. If you're not aware of her work, I urge you to look into it. Rian Eisler wrote The Chalice and the Blade and she is a brilliant woman archaeologist, a refugee from Nazi Europe. And her notion is, you know, that not that there was a patriarchy in prehistory and then we fell in, I mean, a matriarchy and then we fell into patriarchy and that this has been the problem. She has managed to de-genderize the cultural debate by inventing the terms partnership, culture, and dominator culture. We live in a dominator culture, and so do the English, in spite of Margaret Thatcher. It's not about women, and it's not about men. It's about feminine and masculine attitudes. And uh, Rian, using the work of Maria Gambutas and other people, has made a brilliant case that... Uh, the, the natural uh, equilibrium state of human society is to be in a partnership culture where uh, higher, the only hierarchies are hierarchies of function. People do what they can do well, but an administrator is not a more advanced member of society than a gardener. Nothing is seen to be intrinsically somehow higher or lower. There are just functions performed by people. Well, the great hope that she holds out is that if we recognize that what happened was simply a mistake, the allowing of the dominator model to come into being, then recognizing it as a mistake, we can simply correct the mistake. So she offers tremendous hope. It's not a we are doomed and, you know, the selfish gene, that rap, or the territorial imperative, that rap, or all of these we're doomed kind of raps that come out of sociobiology and that kind of thing. We're not doomed at all. Now, what I've hoped to do and, and want to do is accept Rian's premise that there was... Uh, a partnership culture that around 1500 BC died out completely, its last stand being Minoan Crete, and that it was then replaced by a, a dominator culture. What I, I accept all that. What I want to know is why? How could such a thing have happened? If a model of culture, an adaptation like that, had been perfected that worked, what factor could then come into the picture and overturn it and cause it to be lost? And I think what it is, is uh, the, the partnership culture maintain, was feminized in its approach to society because it maintained a connection to the psychedelic world through plants. It kept a proper perspective on the true um, rank of import 
of the structures of the psyche. Because as soon as you get the fall of Minoan Crete, what you get is the beginnings of Greek philosophy. And when you get formal philosophy, you and you get the rise of the Homeric period, all this happened about the same time. We're talking 1100 BC here in the Eastern Mediterranean. You get the glorification of the marauder, the warrior, the glorification of the king, and, uh, and the uh, evolution of slavery in the Greek model that we kept up with right up until 1865. The slaves of ancient Egypt were the property of the royal household. Slaveholding was not something that everybody was into, as it was later, where wealth meant slaves. So I think that what the psychedelic thing can be seen as, is an, when it's done with plants, is a return to Gaia, an immersion in the feminine. Uh, James Joyce talks about what he calls the mama matrix most mysterious. That's what you're seeing, those lights against darkness, all that stuff. It is the potential for creative exuberance that resides in the phonic feminine matrix. It is the body of the goddess. And the ego can only create and maintain its tiny world of self-reflective concerns if it stifles this connection to the unconscious. So the terror of drugs that is paralyzing our society is there's really only one terror in our society. It's the terror of the feminine. And the terror of drugs is a terror of giving up control. This is what people are most alarmed about by psychedelics, is the giving up control. And remember in the 60s, it was all about ego loss, and people strove for it and claimed to have achieved it, and this and that. And it was never couched in this male-female thing. But uh, I think that's a male problem and a male way of uh, sort of of setting the table for the banquet to talk about ego loss. A partnership society is going to involve a lot of ego loss. It's going to involve a lot of seeing your brother and your sister as interchangeable with yourself. It's going to bring, I think, a major sexual revolution because... So much of sexuality over the past 500 years has been based on, it was almost the coinage of the ego's dealings with the world. How many women are under my domination? Uh, are you mine? Am I yours? It, and people have always stressed that the problem was in the possession, but it's really in the casting of the subject and the object there, my, me and you, not the relationship. And so I have, uh, I'm sure you've all heard me say this on tape, to me the major metaphor that is operating in the 20th century is what I call the archaic revival. We are, our civilization is falling to pieces. It's assumptions are no longer any good. It just doesn't work. And by our civilization, I mean from Moscow to the Potomac to Tokyo to Sydney to Bangkok and back to Paris. Global civilization is not working. They may still be working in the rainforest, but only if we haven't reached them yet. And as soon as we reach them, They'll be sent to work in sawmills and uh, involved in growing coca for the drug trade and, and be ruined. When a society is in trouble the way we are in trouble, what it does unconsciously, it just in the same way that a drowning person reaches outward, is it reaches outward for a previous cultural metaphor to stabilize itself. We can understand this by looking at the Renaissance, where 
as the medieval world began to crack to pieces uh, and cynicism about the church and the pope and all of this and cities began to and the Jews began to be turned loose to make money and trading networks began to be established. All of these new things began to be tolerated. The Renaissance reached back to Greece and Rome for steadying metaphors. And this is what classicism is. It's an effort to be more like Greece and Rome than Greece and Rome were, to have their laws, their architecture, uh, their uh, technologies, theories of road building, warfare, and politics. Uh, in our situation, the culture crisis is much worse because of the bomb, because it is global because of high speed communication we we can't become we can't reach back to ancient egypt or the anastasi or the maya it has to be something further back it actually has to be something outside of history and this is what sets the stage for the archaic revival we want to return to the cultural models of 15 to 20,000 years ago not that we are going to become uh, Neolithic people, but we need to cultivate the same things they cultivated for very different reasons. They were hunter-gatherers with a deep sensitivity to nature in order that their very small numbers could uh, prosper and spread. We must be, become gardeners of the planet and ecologically conscious people, because otherwise there won't be any land left to stand on. Their concern with myth and ritual, with images from the unconscious expressed in mask making and carving and fetishes, we see early in the 20th century's concern for the great revolution in art. So Picasso went to West Africa and brought these masks back and other people brought back primitive art and it was seen to be you know more true to the human feelings of the early 20th century than the romantic fin de siècle art that had come before which was really the last tail wagging of the baroque and rococo era which was the come down from the renaissance so modern art the discoveries of Freud and Jung, that there was more to life than being awake or asleep, but that there were, you know, spirits, the rebirth of a sense of spiritual values. You know, at mid-century, it looked like we were all going to become French intellectuals, existential, atheistic, Marxist, uh, just this flat, flat empty thing. Jean-Paul Sartre's statement on nature is, nature is mute. Nature has nothing to say to man. Well, this is, to my mind, you know, a monstrous statement designed to lead people astray. If nature is mute, no wonder the existentialists felt lost. They had precluded the one connection to authentic being that was available to them. So um, I see the psychedelic experience as both the centerpiece of prehistoric life and destined to be the centerpiece of any future that we want to be part of. And we can imagine fascist futures, futures of vast regimentation and machine-like behavior where everyone is reduced to... Uh, just being an automaton within a vaster automaton. But these are not futures we want to live with. A humane future is going to, as I said last night, place the expansion of consciousness in its very center. And this means accepting the role of the feminine, not as political rhetoric, but as the facts of the matter. I don't know if I told this group last night, but... Uh, I always think of what Chesterton said. He said, men are men, but man is a woman. And that's the fact of the matter. And by realizing that man is a woman, 
you, there's, no, there's no debate. It's not a discussion. There's no convincing. It's just a fact, like that water runs downhill. You're going to have to get straight about it. Then there is a possibility for uh, fitting ourselves into a partnership future. Rian has thought this all out in her head, theoretically. I don't know whether she is a psychedelic uh, traveler or not, but she and I immediately had lots to say to each other because she has, you could say, found her way there by another route. Uh, the tension in the world is the tension between the ego and the feminine, not between the masculine and the feminine, and everyone who has an ego, and many women in positions of power do, has an unresolved problem with this ego-feminine thing. The return to the archaic mode gives permission for this to happen, and the psychedelic experience stabilizes it, because women are always at home with the mystery, probably because they are the ones who give birth and they are usually the ones who make dying, uh, ease the way of the dying. So I don't think women have this desire for neatness and closure that dominates men. Men want it to be straightforward, well-organized, move on time, no mystery. Science, as the great enterprise of paternalism, has come to the end of its road. It has not only swept the kitchen, it's now sweeping the yard. And as it sweeps the yard, it's sinking deeper and deeper in the earth because there's no floor on reality. There is a science, and they are beginning to admit this and say, well, there's something wrong. We thought we, it would be one more particle or one more something or other, and it just seems to endlessly recede in front of us. This is not a problem. This is a solution. This is what science has been needing to hear for 500 years is enough already. We now have a science which can do anything or almost anything we want technologically. So that's its tool-making function. It's fulfilled that very nicely. Why do we believe that it will elucidate the mysteries of the soul? It won't. That's another concern. It's a concern of individuals. You want to understand a mystery of the soul, you don't get a $5 billion budget and a team of six universities linked by computer to attack it. No, you go into the wilderness and you eat mushrooms. It's that kind of work. It's more the work of the poet than the work of the research scientist. And certainly in the archaic mode, the poet was uh, the model for men and women. I mean, poet has a masculine connotation in our society, but that's because we're so screwed up. We even had a separate word for women poets, a poetess, you see. But the making of poetry, the living in the primal world of poetry, can only be done if you have a direct connection to the mystery. And that cannot happen as long as the ego is the god. We were in the conference last week kidding around down at the baths, and I was saying that I had invented the smallest form of memory, that memories were made of particles, and that the smallest particle of memory was called a nemon. And then somebody said, well, if memories are made of particles, then is consciousness made of particles? I said, well, maybe it is. Well, then what shall we name the smallest unit of consciousness? And Kat said, uh, how about calling it the ego? <laughs> and I think that's a good place to begin. Let's get it in its proper perspective. The ego is the smallest amount of consciousness anybody can deal with in the ordinary world. But uh, you build outward from the ego. You put two egos together, and maybe you've either got... Uh, a uh, conflict, which is always interesting, or better yet, a love affair. Well, 
you put three egos together and you've got a menage a trois, four, and you have a corporation, and so forth and so on. So complexity of consciousness arrives out of building on the atom of the ego, not trying to squeeze everything down into it. The uh, intellectual richness of our heritage is unimaginable. It is our greatest legacy. I mean, you can forget your fleets of Rolls Royces and that Monet that they're holding for you in Paris and your summer house on Ibiza. It's nothing compared to the richness of the imagination, not William Blake's imagination or uh, Donatello or Caravaggio, but your imagination. There's more and better art in your head than is hanging on the walls of the great galleries of art of this planet. That's what makes history so exciting, because we have just begun. We really are just shaking the leaves out of our hair and scraping the lice out of our fur and beginning to talk about how we could have a civilization here. We could have a sane planet with sane people living on it, leading happy productive lives with everybody with enough to eat, everybody getting laid enough, everybody getting to be famous enough, everybody getting what they need by abandoning this, uh, you know, I think it was Freud who compared the, the gathering of money to the retention of shit, to the holding of your stuff, you know, to being that possessive and that crazed about the products of your own, uh, your own psyche and body. The role that psychedelics play in this, if, if I haven't made clear enough, is that they caused it, they maintain whatever of it has gone on through the dark centuries of monotheism when these things were forbidden. And I'm, I put it that way in order to jibe Muslims, Jews, and Christians equally, because we all have shared in the carrying forward of a really odd idea. And, uh, uh, and psychedelics now, as we decondition ourselves from the post-medieval world, they are present to hand as tools. And I think people such as yourselves know this. It, what we need to do is create a common language. In the 60s, the odd thing was everybody agreed that LSD was very, very important, but nobody could really say how it was important outside of the fact that it had been important to them. And I think if you give permission to look at the role in the, of the plants and of shamanism and of the mystery religions, do your homework, go back into history and see how it worked, then you see that the real revolution is going to be the realization that if it weren't for psychedelics, we wouldn't even be here. This thing that we're so concerned to deny and repress in our society, which is drugs, is the sine qua non of being, not bad drugs. I'm not advocating cocaine addiction, heroin use, that sort of thing. We will talk at some other time about habits and the habit of having habits. But uh, those are creatures of the laboratory, pernicious imps that have been summoned forth by the scientific establishment and let loose in society to really confuse the issue. Uh, if I could, by an act of fiat, uh, change the linguistic world around, I would make it impossible to use the word drugs to talk about what we're talking about. Drugs are things, uh, medicine for ill people coming out of the laboratory, coming out of uh, theories of medicine that come out of mechanistic science. Plants are what we're talking about. And I've I used to sort of shy away from the word magic, but more and more I come to, I've come to like it because it makes the right people so uptight. And so just talk about magic plants 
who's going to bust you for magic plans? So you mean drugs? No, just magic plans. So, oh, I see. Well, you're an airhead, so. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, so what I'm tr talking about this morning is my hope that the awareness of psychedelics as a personal force in each of your lives, I don't think I have to talk to you about that. You're self-selected for being here, and you know that. What I want to talk about is how important it is to re-understand our history, to re-understand that this is us. We didn't get to this place by ourselves. What distinguishes us from the other primates is that we formed a symbiotic relationship with a mystery. And the mystery is an intelligence on this planet. We can't say how long, at least as long as we have been here, may have come from the stars, could be an extraterrestrial intellect, could be the dark recesses of our own mind that we have evolved so far from that we cannot recognize. But we might as well treat it like an extraterrestrial because no extraterrestrial that we are going to meet is going to be as alien as this thing that we have found in ourselves. The aliens of Hollywood who come in metallic ships with an interest in our atomic power plants or our redwood trees or whatever are just like the guy living next door compared to the entities that we find in our own mind. So it doesn't do any good to psychologize the alien and say, as Jung attempted to say, well, it's the autonomous other. Autonomous psychic components in the human mind present themselves as elves, fairies, sprites, and aliens. Once you've met an elf, a sprite, a fairy, or an alien, you realize that waving the wand that says this is a component of your own psyche is just ludicrous. It's as ludicrous as me waving a wand at you and announcing that that's gotten rid of your existential validity because you're a part of my own psyche. You know, it's uh, madness when applied to another person. And I think it's equally appropriate when applied to, uh, to these entities contract contacted in the trance to do that to try to reduce it to say well it's just one part of my head talking to another is to fall into this paternalistic scientific desire to have it all be very neat how would it be if it's not neat at all how would it be if nobody really knows what's going on how would it be if understanding what reality is actually depended for you upon you and that book by Fritsch of Capra that you paid eighteen ninety five for isn't going to do it. And neither is sitting at the feet of some guru that it's serious business. And the first thing to understand is that nobody knows that that you're not looking for a teacher. It hasn't been found out. It's not sitting on the shelf of some library. It is being figured out now and your job is to die with the state of the art understanding having emerged into your mind five minutes before you got there and then you know that will carry you through we need to awaken to the adventure and the richness and the openness of the game the rules have not yet been forged we will forge the rules ourselves, each for ourselves and each for the rest of us by working forward through this thing. Uh, I think we're at the very beginnings of grappling and dealing with the psychedelic era. We are like people talking about evolution in 1855. You know, a few of us have read Darwin's paper. Nobody's sure exactly what it means. It's a strong intuition of something. The species thing is a problem. Nobody's quite sure. Uh, there's uh, a new model of life and culture ahead of us, and it comes out of exploring with each other the places we have been by ourselves, the places that we have gone and been taken by the spirit.